Welcome to Learn It Training. The exercise files for today's course are located in the video description below. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Google Workspace. My name is Trish Connor Cato. This course is recommended for users who want to get a quick overview of Google Workspace applications. This class is especially appropriate for individuals moving to Google Workspace from Microsoft Office. We'll start by focusing on Google Drive in Module 1. Google Drive is the file storage application of the Workspace apps. You'll learn about the display screen, how to change Drive options, and even how to create a file from Drive. We'll move on to making a copy of a file and moving a file to trash before we upload a file from a hard drive. You'll learn how to create and manage folders as well as how to upload a folder from a hard drive. We'll move on to learning how to search for files and how to add shortcuts to Drive for efficiency purposes. We'll cover how to work with Drive priority and workspaces. And this feature is only available for a business workspace account. But if you don't have a business workspace account, you can still view the feature in the video. And you'll also learn how to change Google Drive settings. We'll end the module by learning how to sign into multiple Google accounts for easy access. We continue with learning Google Drive in Module 2, where you'll learn how to collaborate in Drive. You'll learn how to share a file or folder, and we'll end the module by publishing to the web. The third module focuses on common features. It highlights features common to most of the Google Workspace apps. You'll learn how to open a Google app before creating a new file. You'll get an overview of the menu and toolbar and how to use them. You'll also learn how to access help, how to rename a file, and how to email a file. We'll move on to how to download files in other formats, and we'll end this module after learning how to open a Microsoft Office file in a Google app and how to work with versions. We'll dive into Google Sheets, the Google Workspace spreadsheet application. You'll learn about its display screen and how to input data along with some cool shortcuts. We'll move on to creating formulas, working with functions, and using the Google Sheets functions list. Then we will format numbers and learn how to preview and print a worksheet. We'll switch our focus to creating charts and working with both the chart editor setup and customize options. We'll explore pivot tables and how to create and use named ranges before ending the module by learning how to protect sheets and ranges. In module five, our focus will strictly be on using Google Docs. This is the Google Workspace word processing application. We'll learn about its display screen and then move on to changing the view of a document. Along the way, you'll learn how to insert images and page numbers. We'll use styles in our document and learn how to access the document outline. We'll end this module by collaborating with suggesting mode and working with comments. Google Slides will be the focus of module six. Slides is the Google Workspace presentation app. After understanding its display screen, You'll learn how to enter text on a slide and learn how to change the view of a presentation. You'll learn how to add an image to a slide and how to add, delete, and reorder slides. We'll apply a theme to our presentation, which will make it more visually appealing and learn how to add transitions and animations to keep the audience's interest. We'll finish this module by delivering a presentation and using both presenter view and audience tools. Module seven is all about Google Forms, the form creation app in Google Workspace. After understanding its display screen, we'll create a form, add questions to it, send a form, link a form to a spreadsheet, and view form responses. 
will direct our focus to Google Meet, the Google Workspace video meeting app. You will learn how to schedule a meeting from Google Calendar and how to join a video meeting. Of course, you will learn the Meet display screen before presenting your screen in a meeting. You'll learn how to manage meetings as well as how to change audio and video settings. We'll end by learning how to start a video meeting from Gmail and from Google Meet. Looking to support our channel and get a great deal? Become a member today to unlock ad-free videos. That's right, your favorite courses without a single ad. Interested in a specific video? Purchase one of our ad-free courses individually. Looking for even more? Gain access to exams, certificates, and exclusive content at learnatanytime.com. More information can be found in the video description below. Before we get started, I'd like to say that I will be using two Google Workspace business accounts during this course. Now, you can also be successful if you have access to two personal Google accounts, although there are a handful of features that you won't be able to use if you're using a personal account. At least you'll get to see these features on screen because of the type of account I'm using in this video. In addition, it would be helpful if you had two different accounts that you can use, and that might be an easier proposition if you're using personal Google accounts. Also, we'll be using a handful of files that are in the video description, so you may wanna go ahead and grab them, and there's also one folder in there. You might wanna grab everything and store it somewhere on your hard drive that you can access during this course. In our first module, we'll begin using Google Drive. We have 15 lessons in this module. We'll start by signing into Google Apps and using the Google Apps menu. We'll go over the Google Drive display screen, and then you'll learn how to change Drive display options. We'll create a file from within Drive, and move on to making a copy of a file and moving a file to trash. Now we do have files in the video description we'll be using for this course. In lesson eight of module one, we'll be uploading two of those files from a hard drive and they're named Learn It Logo, which is a PNG file and 2022 sales, which is an Excel file. In lesson nine, we're gonna create and manage folders. In lesson 10, we'll be uploading a folder from a hard drive. And also in the video description, you'll see a 2021 sales folder that we'll be using in that lesson. You'll also learn how to search for files, how to add shortcuts to my drive, well, your drive. And in lesson 13, You'll learn how to work with Drive Priority and Workspaces. They're only available if you have a Google Workspace business account. We'll move on to changing Google Drive settings and then end this module by signing into multiple Google accounts. The first thing we're gonna do is go to google.com and we're gonna sign in to Google Apps. And when you use the blue sign in button in the upper right hand corner of the screen, it signs you into all of the Google apps. So we're gonna do that right now. I'm gonna go ahead and click sign in. And this is where I give my disclaimer. I will be using two business accounts through this course. At the end of this module, you'll learn how to add another account so you can switch back and forth between multiple accounts. The accounts that I'm using, I created just for these videos. And so in other words, if you try to email me at any of the email addresses you see me using, you will not get a response. So I'm gonna go ahead and put in what I call my primary email address. And then I'm gonna go ahead and click next. 
It's going to prompt me for my password, and I can show it by checking this box. And once I have it in, I'm going to go ahead and click Next. So it takes me back to Google.com, but this time, when I look in the upper right corner, instead of the blue sign-in button, I have access to my account represented by the letter T, the first initial of my first name. And to the left of that, you will see a series of nine dots. And we're going to use the apps menu to access Drive. From within Drive, let's go to the apps menu. And you can see that I can get to my account from here. Here's all the apps that I can get into. And as I keep scrolling down, you'll see other apps that are connected as well. Let's review the Drive display screen. So you already know where the apps menu is. And also to the right of that is how you can access your Google account. I'll go over to the upper left. The icon for Drive and the word Drive are both links. So sometimes if you're just sitting in Drive and you're working on other windows on the internet, Drive may get stagnant. And so you can click on Drive or the icon in order to refresh the screen. Underneath that on the left, this area on the left is known as your menu. And this is one of the things you won't have if you're using a personal Google account. You won't have the priority there. And so don't worry about that. Like I said, later on, you'll see how that works, even if you don't have it. My Drive is like your main repository. So whenever you go to Drive, unless you have priority and you switch it, it will always go to my drive. Now I happen to have a folder in here from another Google course that I did, but if your drive may be empty and you're gonna learn more about how to use it during this module. And then there's another one that shared drives where you can have a shared drive that you use if you're like working with a team. Then there's shared with me any files and folders that have been shared with me would show up here. I have my th some things under recent from a previous course that I did. Starred is just another way for you to easily find files or folders. You can star them and then they, everything that you star will be in that starred category. And then you have trash, which is where anything that is deleted will go. And it empties the trash after 30 days. The items in trash will be deleted automatically after 30 days, unless you go in and manually tell it to empty the trash. And then at the bottom, it gives you the amount of storage that you're currently using. And it allows you to get to storage. So when I go into storage, it again is showing me the total amount used and it divides it in a business account, at least it does. So it's telling me how much in Drive, Gmail, Photos, and then it lists all the files that are using Drive storage there. So I'm gonna just go back to my Drive. Now at the top, you have your search bar, right? You can search anywhere in Drive, whether it's in any of these different categories, it will find it, and you'll learn how to search. In order to get help, you can use the question mark to go to support, and then you have a gear that takes you through settings. The middle of the screen is showing you My Drive, anything that you have in My Drive. So I happen to have a folder there. If I had files there, it would be a category called files, so on and so forth. And my drive is a drop down where I can recreate everything that is on that new button at the top of the menu. So I can do it over at new or I can click the down arrow on my drive to access the same menu.
To the right, you have an icon and that will let you switch to list layout. Um, if I click on it, it switches to grid layout. And once we get some files and folders in here, we'll revisit the layouts. And then you have, you'll notice on the right, you have this details and activity screen for my drive. I can close it by using the X in its upper right hand corner. And then that information icon is view details so I can get that panel open again. And now we're going to create a file from within drive. Again, we can use the new icon on the menu on the left or your my drive drop down. Either way, you'll see that you have new folder, file upload, folder upload, and then you have Google Docs, Google Sheets, slides, forms, and more. And we're going to hover over the arrow to the right of Google Docs, and we're going to choose blank document. And I'll show you here that the untitled document opened on a new tab in your browser window. You'll learn more about the common features across most workspace apps and more in depth about Google Docs in a later module. But for right now, if you have a summary and outline window open on the left, you can close it by using the left arrow. And where it says type at to insert, we're gonna just type a brief sentence or two. So I'm gonna type Google Drive is the file storage app in Google Workspace. You can store Google Apps files as well as other file types. And in parentheses, I'm gonna put Microsoft Office, comma, PDF, comma, dot mp4 comma etc in drive and so notice at the top it's either saying saved right if it already disappeared where it's that little cloud with the check mark if you hover over that it will say see document status and so you can see that all changes have been saved to drive and that this document is not ready for offline use. And I'm going to just ignore that for right now. So it's automatically saving. Um, here, it lets me know that the last edit was seconds ago. And in the upper left where it says untitled document, if you hover over there and you click, it's going to want to name it like the first sentence you type. And I'm gonna just modify that. I want the name to just be Google Drive. And when I do that edit and press enter, it gives it that name and it's saved in Drive. So because I'm kind of done with this document now, the Google Drive doc that we just created, I can close the browser tab that it's on and I'm still in my drive. And now you can see I have a files category and it shows that Google Drive document. Now I'm gonna show you two ways that you can copy a file in Google Drive. Now, before we do that, I have this file selected and I can tell that it's selected because the name of the file at the bottom has blue shading. And I wanna look at this details on the right side. So it's showing me a little preview of the document and when I click on it, it takes me into the document, right? And I'm gonna go ahead and close that browser tab. 
It also lets me know who has access, details about the file, including where it's located when it was last modified, opened, and created, and where you can add a description. So one way you can copy a file is you can right click. I'm going to right click on that Google Drive file and I'm going to choose make a copy. It lets me know in the lower left that it's creating a copy and then it, that it did create a copy. And I'm going to dismiss that pop up. And you can see that I have Google Drive and copy of Google Drive. Since the copy of Google Drive is what's selected, I'm going to just do control C on my keyboard to copy it. And then I'm going to click anywhere on my drive screen and do control V. And it's going to give me a pop-up, which I'm going to allow. So in the lower left hand corner, it lets me know that it's working. And now you'll see that I have Google drive copy of Google Drive, and copy of copy of Google Drive. I like to give options. So just like I showed you two different ways to copy a file, I'm going to show you two different ways of moving a file to the trash. So you don't want it anymore. You don't need it anymore. I'm going to right click on the copy of Google Drive file. And down at the bottom, I'm going to choose remove. And then it's going to confirm that I'm moving it to the trash, that the copy of Google Drive will be deleted forever after 30 days. I'm going to click on move to trash. Now, another way of doing it, and you can see in the lower left, you can undo that if you need to. Another way of doing it is by dragging and dropping it onto trash. So I'm going to do the copy of the copy of Google Drive. I'm going to just click and hold on it and I'm going to drag it over to trash on the menu on the left and drop it. I get the same confirmation and I'm going to choose move to trash again. Now let's go to trash. And I mentioned earlier when we were doing our tour of the screen that Everything will be deleted after 30 days. Unless you want to ever manually come in, you can do that and choose to empty trash up in the right. I'm going to go back to my drive. I'm also going to show you two different ways to upload a file from your hard drive to drive. And the first way is I'm going to use the new button on the left and I'm going to choose file upload. And then I'm already in the directory where I had the files from the video description. And I'm going to select the Learn It logo and choose the Open button. So it lets me know in the lower right and the upload is now complete. I can close that panel. And under my files, I now have that PNG Learn It logo file. Another way to do it is to arrange your screen so you can see the file directory where you have the files from the video description as well as your drive screen at the same time. So now that I have them arranged like this, this is the hard drive on my computer and then I have my drive. I am going to just grab this 2022 sales Excel file, click and hold it and drag it over. And you'll see that it puts a blue border around where your folders and files are in drive. And it says drop files to upload them to my drive. I'm going to let it go up there and it's uploading one item. The upload is complete. I'm going to maximize my drive screen again. And you can see that we use the new button to get the Learn It logo uploaded and we dragged and dropped 2022 sales Excel file. For organizational purposes, you may want to create folders in your My Drive. And so we're going to do just that. Now, I can do it from either the new 
button or the My Drive drop down. I'm using My Drive drop down this time, and I'm going to choose New Folder. And I'm going to name the folder 2022 Sales and click on Create. So now in my folder section, I have my previous folder that I have, and I have this newly created 2022 sales folder. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to drag the 2022 sales Excel file and drop it on top of the new folder. And it moves it from my drive into that folder. So if I double click, the 2022 sales folder, I'll see that Excel file in it. And up at the top, I like to point this out. I call it like a breadcrumb trail. It's letting me know where I am. I want to click on my drive there to get back to my drive. Now that we have some files and folders, let's take a look at our view button in the upper right. I click on it and it changes it to list layout. So if you want everything listed like this, you could. You would have your folders first and then any files. And then the grid layout is the way that it was originally. So I just figured I'd point that out to you. We saw it a little bit earlier. So you, and that's a personal choice. It depends on how I'm working, which layout I prefer to use. Now let's talk about some other things you can do with folders. Let's right click on our 2022 sales folders. Now, a lot of these things you can do if you right click on a file, um, a folder has something else there. You can search within the folder from this right click menu and you can change the color. I'm going to change the color of that folder to like an orange color just because, right? Now, the other thing you need to know about folders is this. Let's drag that 2022 sales folder to trash. And it lets us know that it will be deleted after 30 days. Move it to trash. Well, the thing is, is when you delete a folder or you move a folder to trash, any files within it are also in trash. Let's go to our trash folder right click on 2022 sales folder and choose restore and then go back to my drive. So the thing is, is if you want to delete the folder, but keep the file, you would have to move the file out of the folder before you delete the folder. Just like we uploaded a file, you can do it from drag and drop or from new. You can also upload a folder from your hard drive. So I'm going to go to new and I'm going to choose folder upload. And it already has me in my directory and there is a 2021 sales folder and I'm going to double click it or click it once and choose upload. So it's asking me for permission to upload a file to this site. I'm going to choose upload. So the upload is complete. And now I have a 2021 sales folder. And when I double click it, I can see that there is an Excel file inside of it. I'm going to go back to my drive and go ahead and give your 2021 sales folder a color. So I've decided to keep all my sales folders the same color. And I colored my Google forms, my previous folder with another color. When we did our tour of the display, I pointed out that you can search from the search box up top. And you saw when we right clicked on a folder that we have the ability to search within the folder. Let's go ahead and click in the search box up top. And you can see, well, this is another login of mine. So just ignore that. You can see that you can search for documents, spreadsheets, presentations, so on and so forth. You can actually search based on the name of the file or folder or contents within it. So in the search box, I'm going to type logo 
And notice that it will pull up any file that has the word logo in its name. I'm going to use the X on the right side of the search box to clear the search. And this time I'm going to search for sales. And so I get four results, right? I get my sales Excel files as well as both sales folders. And I'm going to do the X on the right again. Now, all the way to the right of the search box, you have an icon and when you hover over it, it says show search options. Let's click on that. So this is where you can get more specific. I can search for any type of file and there's even more types here than are in the search box. I can search by the owner of the file. So anyone, things that are owned by me, not owned by me or owned by a specific person, a file that has certain words in the file, an item name, which is a term that matches part of the file name, like when we did logo and we did sales. The location is set to anywhere. It could be in trash, starred, or encrypted. Date modified. If you're using approvals, it's awaiting my approval or requested by me. Or files that have been shared to a specific person or email address. We're going to put in the has the words box, Google Workspace. And at the bottom, we're going to click search. So I have a couple of things. I have something extra in my drive from a previous course that's in my forms folder, my Google forms folder, but you should have that original Google drive doc as a result in which we use the words Google workspace. And I'm going to do the X in the search box. And the other thing I'm going to do is in the search box with all of these icons here, I'm going to click on folders. So it's showing any folders that you may have. And I'm going to clear the search again and just go back to my drive. Now let's say that you find yourself still working on the 2021 sales and 2022 sales Excel spreadsheets, both of which reside in folders. Now, if you look at the top of your My Drive window, you have suggested. If you search for a file or you open a file, it may add it to the suggested list. What I'm going to do is I'm going to right click on the first file I have under suggested. And at the very bottom, I'm going to choose not a helpful suggestion. So it removes it from my suggested list. I'm going to do that with the other file that I have up there as well. Sometimes I just don't want the clutter and I don't want the suggestions that my drive makes for me. So that's how you can remove them. Now, if I'm working on those two spreadsheets, often, say like every day for a while, maybe I'm doing some analysis or the comparison between the sales over the two years, whatever the case may be, I don't want to have to come into Drive, go into the folder to access the file. So I can add shortcuts to my Drive, and we're going to do this right now. Let's double click the 2021 sales folder. And then we're going to right click on the 2021 sales Excel file and choose add shortcut to drive. And it gives you some options as to where to place it. I'm going to leave it on my drive. And at the bottom, I'm going to choose add shortcut. So now when I go back to my drive, you can see if I go down under my files, that it has a little curved arrow icon on 2021 sales Excel file, which indicates that there's a shortcut to that file. And if I hover over the file name, it tells me it's a shortcut. So now what I'd like you to do 
is the same for 2022 sales, go into the folder and make a shortcut of the Excel file. And now in my drive, you'll see both shortcuts. So an easy way to access files that you're frequently working on. And at the end of the day, if you right click on a shortcut file, right? You see shortcut options. You can move it to somewhere else, add it to star, rename, all of that, make a copy, a remove. So we added shortcuts to my drive to make it easier to locate files without having to go through different folders and stuff. Now, if you have a workspace business account, and you have priority on the left side at the top of your menu, you can work with drive priority and workspaces, which is even more efficient than my shortcuts. So once you add important or frequently accessed files to a workspace in drive priority, you can set priority to be your home page. And then that way, every time you go into drive, you will automatically see important or frequently accessed files as soon as you open the app. So again, if you're using a personal account, you will not be able to do this, but you can either skip this portion of the video or watch to see what the feature does. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to my priority on the left side. It still will have suggested things in here. I can collapse that area. And here it wants me to create a workspace. So I'm going to create a workspace and I'm going to call it all sales and create. So now I can add files to this workspace. I'm going to click the add files button. And on the right hand side, it'll come up with recent files that I've used, right? And it's broken out by like today, yesterday, last week. And of course, there's a couple of ways to do this. I'm going to focus on these two sales Excel files. I can select each one by just clicking on them. And at the bottom, it will tell me that there are two selected and I can insert or I can drag and drop them. I'm going to go ahead and insert. So now I have, and, and by the way, at the top, it lets you know that you can have a 25 file limit in any workspace. So at the bottom right, I'm going to select done. And then I have one other thing that I need to do. And that is I need to go to settings. So that's the gear icon in your upper right. And I'm going to choose settings. And again, my storage may look different than yours if you have a personal account. And also you'll notice as I go down, when I get to the bottom on the general tab, I have the opportunity to make priority my default home page, And I'm going to select that option. And then I'm going to use the left arrow in the upper left to go back to get out of settings. And I'm going to just go to my Google apps menu and I'm going to go into docs. And then I'm going to close my drive tab in my browser. I'm going to use the apps menu again to go back to drive. And this time when I go in priority is my home page. So it takes me directly to my sales workspace in this case, and I can have other workspaces in here as well. And when you have a workspace and this one's called all sales, if I go over to the more actions ellipses, I can hide the workspace or remove it or rename it. If I hide it, then it will show up down at the bottom under hidden workspaces. By the way, when I add files to my workspace, it does not remove them from their original locations. So if I go back to my drive here, and I go into my 2021 sales folder, there's that Excel file. And I'm gonna just go back to my drive. So we went into Google settings 
to enable priority as our home page. And let's go back in to the gear in the upper right and go back into settings so you can become familiar with the other settings. So there's general settings, notification settings, and manage app settings. And again, my settings may differ from yours if you're in a personal account. Um, so my storage, again, broken down is showing here. I can convert uploads to Google Docs editor format. I can change my language settings here. I can allow the ability to create, open, and edit recent Google Docs, Sheets, and Slides files while offline. My density for the view is comfortable. So first I'm going to get out of settings and I'm going to put this in list layout. I'm going to go back to settings and my density is comfortable. I'm going to change it to cozy, go back. Looks pretty much the same to me, right? And go back to the gear again, settings, and I'm going to change it to compact, which should make it be a little bit closer. So now I can see a change. I'm going to go back into settings and change it back to comfortable. So it's spaced a little bit more. And then at the bottom under general, you have suggested files. So if you are always unhappy with the suggestions it makes, you can turn off that setting. I find myself hiding or saying this suggestion doesn't work for me a lot. So you may want to turn off that setting. Um, I'm going to turn it off for the shared with me section as well. I'm going to leave make priority my default home page checked. And when we get ready to share, I'm going to leave this check, show suggested recipients in the sharing dialog. So those are your general settings. On the left, let's go to notifications. So you can get updates about Google Drive items in your browser if you like, if you want to check that. I'm going to uncheck get all updates about Google Drive items via email. You know, you just get so many emails during the day. And for me, when I'm working in the apps, I always have Drive open. So I don't really need the notifications for myself personally. And you can also get all updates about Google Drive items while you're working in Google Chat. And I'm going to uncheck that one as well. That's just my personal preference. And then the last section on the left is Manage Apps connect it to drive. And so you have all the apps here and the ones that are managed by drive are checked to be used by default. Um, anyway, I'm going to back out of settings. And last but not least in this module, I'm going to show you how to sign into an additional Google account. So I'm going to just simply go up in the upper right hand corner and click on my T, which represents my Google account. And here I can choose add another account. So it's going to force me to log in. Now this is another email address that is not operational in terms of to the public. It's been created just for this course. So if you email it, you will not get a response. So I'm going to put in my alter ego email here and choose next and go ahead and enter my password and next again. So because I was in drive under my Trish account, when I signed in, it brings me into Drive for my A account, my alter ego account. And not only that, you can see that I have two different Drive browser tabs open. I'm on my alter ego one. And if I go to the other one, it's still logged in to my T account. 
But if I go to T again now, you'll see that I'm signed in in my T account and also my alter ego account. So I can switch tabs. Now for the purposes of training, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go to the My Drive for my A account. I'm gonna right click on that tab and I'm gonna move that tab to a new window. For the purposes of training, it'd be easier for me to switch windows than to switch tabs. So I'm logged in to both my workspace account, my workspace training account, and my alter ego account. And before I end this module, because all of you may not be in business accounts, I'm going to go back to settings and I'm going to not make priority my default home page again, just so I'm on the same my drive whenever I go in and out of drive as some of you may be. To recap module one, we began using Google Drive. We started by signing into Google Apps from google.com. You learned how to use the Google Apps menu to navigate to the Drive app. And then we reviewed the Google Drive display screen. You learned how to change Google Drive display options from list to grid view. And we revisited that later in the lesson when we actually had files and folders to see the difference. In the fifth lesson, you learned how to create a file from within Drive. We created a very brief document. And then we moved on to learning how to make a copy of a file in two different ways, how to move a file to trash in two different ways, and how to upload a file from a hard drive in two different ways. We went on to creating and managing folders and uploading a folder from a hard drive. You learned how to search for files, how to add shortcuts to my drive for easy access to files and how to work with drive priority and workspaces, which then you can make priority your home page for the important files that you're working on. And that will show up whenever you go into drive. We reviewed and changed some Google drive settings, and then we ended by signing into multiple Google accounts, which I then moved my additional account to a new browser window. In module two, we'll be collaborating in Google Drive. We'll start by sharing a file or folder. Then you'll learn how to share a link to a file or folder. And we'll end after the third lesson by publishing to the web. Now we're going to share a file. The process would be the same for sharing a folder. So the file that I want to share is the Google Drive doc that we created earlier. And I'm going to just right click on it and click on share. I could have also chosen manage access on that details panel on the right to get to this screen. So here I can add people and groups that I want to share with. Um, my other account is already here. Otherwise I could type in the email address to get it to pop up. I'm going to just select my other account, my alter ego account and notice to the right, it defaults to editor on my drive. So that's the type of access. If I do the drop down next to editor, I can switch it to viewer where they won't be able to make any changes at all. They'll just be able to read the document. Commenter where they can suggest changes to the document. Editor is full access to the document. I could also add an expiration date and time for this access. If I don't add an expiration date, access will automatically expire 30 days from when you share at 11.59 p.m. I'm going to leave Alter Ego with Editor Access. I don't have to notify people. 
It's nice if you do, but I don't have to. I choose not to here. They would get an email if I notified them. I'm just going to simply do share. In the lower left, it lets me know that access has been updated. Now I've switched over to my alter ego drive and you can see that the Google drive doc is there and it's saying it was shared just now by me. And it will also show on the left in the menu under shared with me. So you can see how it goes into the person's drive, even if you don't send them a message. I'm back in my primary account, my Trish account, and I'm in my drive still. This time we're gonna share a link to a folder. So under my folders, I'm gonna right click on 2021 sales and choose get link. Now this screen looks very much like the share screen, but what we're going to do in the bottom left, we're going to go ahead and click on copy link. And it lets you know the link has been copied and we're going to choose done. Now I can distribute that link in a few different ways, Gmail, chat, so on and so forth. I'm going to go to my apps menu and I'm going to launch chat. And at the top in the search box, I'm going to click. And for me, it will automatically bring up my other email address, my alter ego email address. If not, you can type in a person's email, person's name, if they're in your contacts, so on and so forth. So I'm going to just select alter ego and at the bottom, the very bottom of the screen where it says history is on, that's where I am going to type my message. So I'm going to just say, please review as discussed. And then I'm going to do control V to paste the link in and notice it shows the 2021 sales folder here. And I'm going to go to the bottom right corner where the blue right pointing arrow is to send the chat. And once I do that, even though you're sending a link, you still have to give the person access to the folder or the file. So it's saying it's already marked share with people, alter ego. I'm going to give them editor access to this folder. And then in the bottom right, click send message. And it sends the chat message. I'm going to switch back over to my alter ego browser window. So in alters account, the shared folder is already in drive. Now, if they weren't in drive and say they had their chat open, I'm going to go ahead to the apps menu and go to alters chat and click on it on the left, because they've been given access, they could use the link in the chat. So if they're working in Drive, they'll see it once the screen refreshes, or if not, their chat will notify them that they have the link. Now this is because of my settings that I have set up. So that's why this person is automatically getting what I'm sharing with them in their Drive because of how I have those features set up. And now I want to show you one other thing. I'm back in Alters Drive account, and I'm just going to right click on that 2021 sales folder that's in my shared with me. And I'm going to go to get link. So down here at the bottom, you can see the general access is restricted to only people with access can open with the link. So that's why when we sent the link via chat, it made us, it required us to give alter ego access as well. If I do the drop down next to restrict it, since I'm in a business workspace account, I can change this to people within my organization. 
So anyone that I send a link to within my organization will automatically have access or the other choice is anyone with the link, whether they're in or out of your organization would be able to have access. I'm going to just click done on that. If you want to share with a broader range of people, then via link or using the share feature, you can publish a file to the web. Let's go ahead and open, I'm back in my primary account, by the way, I'm gonna open the 2021 sales folder, and then I'm gonna double click that Excel file, and it will open in Google Sheets. And so when it's open in the application, I can go to the file menu, hover over share, and notice that from here I can share with others, similar to sharing from Drive, or I can publish to the web. I'm gonna select publish to web. In this dialog, you have a link tab and an embed tab. On the link tab, underneath link, it says entire document. And I'm gonna do the drop down there and just select sheet one. That's the only thing that has data in this file. Now, it says that you can make your content visible to anyone by publishing it to the web. You can link to or embed your document on a web page. We're gonna leave it on link. There's a drop down next to web page where you have other file types that you can choose. We're gonna leave it on web page. And when you click on publish, at the top, it will ask you, are you sure you wanna publish this selection? We're gonna say cancel for a moment. And I'm gonna expand published content and settings at the bottom. So it says entire document again. When I click on entire document from that drop down, it'll let me select sheet one. I can restrict access to the following. Now, when I check that, it defaults to my organization, right? So I can restrict this access when I publish it to the web. It's only for people within my organization. Otherwise, it's anybody that can access it will be able to get to it. And the bottom check mark is automatically republish when changes are made. So I can click start publishing down here or the publish button again, and it's gonna confirm it and I'm gonna choose okay. So what it does is it generates a link right? And I can share the link by using Gmail, Facebook, or Twitter. Anyone with the link that I share it with will be able to access the document. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to just do control C and copy that link. So I've switched to a browser window and I am going to paste the link into the address bar and press enter. And in the browser, it shows me that 2021 sales sheet. In the second module, Collaborating in Google Drive, we learned how to share a file or folder. We also learned how to share a link to a file or folder and ended by publishing a file to the web. In module three, we'll be working with common features, features that are common across many of the Google applications. We'll begin by opening a Google application in the first lesson of nine, and we'll move on to using the menu and the toolbar. You'll learn how to use help, how to create a new file, how to rename a file, how to email one, and in lesson seven, you'll learn how to download files in other formats. 
In lesson eight, we'll be using a Microsoft Office file that's in the video description. It's called Welcome and it's a Word document. And you'll learn how to open that file in a Google app. And we'll end by working with versions. To work with common features, we're gonna be using Google Docs as our example. So I'm gonna go up to my apps menu and I'm going to choose Docs. Now we should all have the Google Drive doc listed here under recent documents. I have another file listed there as well. And what we're gonna do under start a new document, we're gonna click on blank. So we've been in docs before, but now we're gonna tour the common features. We're also gonna create a little bit of a document here while we do so. So we have an untitled document here. We opened the docs app and we chose the blank template to get where we are now. I wanna show you a different way, another scenario that you might find yourself in. So let's go use the blue icon in the upper left corner that will take us back to Doc's home page. And we're gonna open the Google Drive document that we created earlier in the course. And I just double clicked on it to open it up. And so on this document, Let's say we have this open, we're working on it. We know that every change we make is being saved to drive and we wanna start a new document. We don't have to go back to the docs homepage to do so. We can use the file menu. And so I'm gonna click on file, hover over new and on the right side, choose document. So now I have a new blank document again. So now in this document, we're gonna type a few lines here. The first of which is features common between many Google apps. Enter. We're gonna type opening a Google application Enter, creating a new file, enter. So these are some of the topics we're covering in this module. And we'll type one more here for right now, using the menu and the toolbar. Now let's spend a few moments exploring the menu. So I'm gonna click on file. We already use new. You can see that you can open from here, make a copy, share, email, download, seek approvals if you're using that feature. It's a fairly new feature. Uh, rename, move, add a shortcut to drive, move to trash, version history, which we'll cover, make available offline, and then you have details, language, page setup, and print. Now it is true that many of the applications have a menu bar, but depending on the application, the options may differ. We have an edit menu here with your undo, redo, cut, copy, paste, paste without formatting, so on and so forth. You have your view menu, we have an insert menu, all of the things that you can insert into a document. And it has a little bit of a scroll bar. You have format, tools, extensions, and help. So those are your basic menu options again in some of the apps, some of the options, for example, on the format menu or the insert menu, or even the file menu will differ depending on the app. And then you have your toolbar. Some of the things that you can do from the menu, you can do from your toolbar as well. So for example, let's do this. Let's select the first line that we typed. And from the menu, we're gonna go to the format menu, 
hover over paragraph styles and choose subtitle or hover over it and then on the right, apply subtitle. So we change the style of that line that was selected. And then we look at it and we're like, mm, we want a different style. So right there on the toolbar, directly under the word format on the menu, you'll see the styles and it says subtitle. We're going to go to the drop down there and we're going to choose title. And we think, eh, nah, don't like the way that looks. We're going to go to the drop down again, the styles drop down and change it back to subtitle. And if you click directly on the word subtitle, it will apply it. So you don't have to use that right pop-up menu. Let's select the remaining three lines. And on the toolbar, let's italicize them by using the I. Now, you know, the same shortcut keys, if you're a Microsoft Office user, we have some of the same shortcut keys. So we could have done control I for italics. Now we're going to do control home. Controlling your home key will take you to the very top of a document. Conversely, control end will take you to the very bottom. So we want to be at the top. And we're going to press enter once and then use your up arrow to get all the way at the top again or control home again. And we're going to go to the insert menu this time. And on the insert menu, we're going to select date. And you're going to select today's date, whatever it is for you. And now we're going to learn how to use help from within an application. We're going to go to the help menu and we're going to choose help and the help dialog will open. It will show you some popular help resources at the top. And then as you scroll down, you can see that you can visit the help forum. You can search help, ask the help community and also send feedback to Google. We're going to click where it says search help. And we're going to type bullets. So it will come up with two different topics, which are indicated by the little piece of paper icon. And both of them are the same Add a numbered list, bulleted list, or checklist. And that's what we're looking for. So I'm going to click on the first one of those. And it gives me whether you're doing this on your computer, on your Android, device or on your iPhone or iPad device, the different ways that you do things. I'm going to leave it on computer and it gives you the step-by-step -step of what to do. And then it goes on to other topics similarly related. So I'm going to use the X in the upper right hand corner to close help. And we're going to select the three italicized lines. And on the toolbar, we're going to go over to the right. You'll notice it has a drop down too. click the drop down to the right of bulleted list. So you can choose what kind of bullet you're going to use. I'm going to just go for the default one, which means I can just click right on the bulleted button. And it applies the bullets to those three lines that we have selected. Now click in the upper left where it says untitled document. When you hover over that, it says rename. And when we click in there, it's going to put in whatever is on the first line, which in this case is the date. This is another area where you have two choices. We could go to the file menu and choose rename, or we can just click up in that rename box at the top that has the date. I'm going to select the date in that box and I'm going to name the file common features. And then I just click away from the box and it is renamed. And then just for variety's sake, I'm going to go to file rename and it just brings me back up into that box. 
I'm going to click at the end of features and type of space and add on in Google apps. So common features in Google apps is the ultimate name of the file. As you saw earlier on the file menu, you can email a file to anyone. It doesn't have to be someone in your organization. doesn't have to be someone that even has a Google account. So I'm going to go to file and I'm going to hover over email and then email this file. And I'm going to send it to a, another Gmail account that I have. And again, this account, if you email it, you will not get a response. And it has the subject, which is the name of the file. The message is, this is what I told you about. Feel free to let me know what you think. Something like that. And then I have a choice. I can not send it as an attachment, but include it in the email. I'm going to not check that, right? I want it to be an attachment. At the bottom, it gives you the file type that you can use. I'm going to leave it as a PDF. And I'm going to click send. So now we're going to add to our bulleted list. I'm going to click at the end of using the menu and the toolbar and press enter, get another bullet there, and we'll type in renaming a file, enter emailing a file, enter. We might as well add the rest of the topics that we're covering here, the common features. The next one will be downloading files in other formats. Then we have opening a Microsoft Office file in a Google app. And the last one is working with versions. And you see sometimes that a word will pop up when you start typing it. If you press tab, you'll just accept that word. And so now what we're going to do is you're going to learn how to download this file in another format. So we're going to do that from the file menu. You're going to hover over download and it gives you quite a few different formats that you can choose. And we are going to choose PDF. So now it lets me know that that file, and you can see the PDF symbol, has downloaded. And if I wanted to, I could open the file. I don't necessarily need to do that. So it's in my regular downloads folder. To open a Microsoft Office file in a Google app, we're going to use file open command. And when we get in here, you're going to go to the upload tab at the top. Now I can drag a file here, or I'm going to click on browse and I'm going to choose a word document named welcome. And it lets me know, well, it went really quickly, but it uploaded it. So now if I go back to docs home, I can open that welcome doc. And so one thing I want to I want you to notice at the top right next to the rename box it says .docx and when you hover over that it lets you know it's a Microsoft Word format. So now we'll begin working with versions. Let's go to the file menu again hover over version history, and we're going to choose name current version. And we're going to call this version original from word and save. 
we're going to use control end to get to the end of the document and press enter one time. And we're going to type this course teaches you to collaborate and notice how the word with is there waiting for me. I'm going to press my tab key to collaborate with several Google workspace apps. I'm going to go back to file version history and name the current version. And this one is going to be added description of course and save. Going to press enter again. And this is the last thing we're going to type in here. These features are common with colon enter. Let's grab our bulleted list and we're going to type docs sheets and slides. And we're going to go back to file version history again, name current version, and it's going to be added bulleted list of apps and save. And one last time, we're going to go back to file, hover over version history. And this time we're going to choose C version history. And it opens on the panel to the right. So on that panel, the added bulleted list of apps is highlighted. And that's why those are selected on the screen on the dock. And when I hover over it, it will pop up my name. I can go see the previous version added description of course. And then of course, original from word and Next to all of those versions, you have an ellipsis more actions button. So you can restore a version, rename a version, remove a name and make a copy of a version. Now the last version there, which is the one at the top of the list does not have restore because that is the current version. And down at the bottom of that version history, you have show changes. So that's automatically checked. And that's why it was highlighted on the document itself. So if I check it back, you'll see the highlight corresponding to the version. And now that I've reviewed my version history, you'll notice also there's kind of a little bit of a toolbar there where you can print the stuff out. It tells you it's total one edit based on that version. If I made multiple edits in a version, it would let you know how many I made. And I can use these icons here. It's moving between, if I had multiple edits, it would move between previous and next edits. To get out of here, I can use the arrow, the back arrow in the upper left hand corner. In this module, we began working with some of the features that are common to some of the Google applications. Now you'll notice that I changed the order of the lessons. So we began by opening a Google application, specifically docs, and then we created a new file. So we started with the blank template and then I showed you how to go to the file menu and choose new. We moved on to using the menu and the toolbar and learned how to use the help feature before renaming a file. We moved on to emailing a file, downloading files in other formats, and we opened that welcome word document from within Google docs. We ended by working with versions and viewing the version history. In module four, we'll spend 13 lessons using Google Sheets. We'll start by understanding the Sheets display screen, and then we'll move on to inputting data. 
will create formulas, work with functions, and work with the Google Sheets function list. We'll move on to formatting numbers before previewing and learning how to print a sheet. In Lesson 8, we will be creating a chart. And in Lesson 9, we'll be working with the Chart Editor Setup options. When we get to Lesson 10, you'll learn about the Chart Editor Customize options, and then we'll switch our focus to working with pivot tables, and then creating and using named ranges and protecting sheets and ranges. So I'm back in my primary account, My Drive. And the thing is, I usually hang out in my drive all day. Sometimes I have to refresh the screen, but it's worth it because from there I can get to the apps menu or use the new drop down to create new things. We're going to use the apps menu and we're going to go to sheets. And from the sheets home screen, we're going to choose blank. So just like with the common features, you get, in this case, Untitled Spreadsheet. It has a menu bar and a toolbar. Toolbar has some extra icons at the end, like this one has functions at the end of the toolbar. And you have the ability to format numbers from the toolbar when you're in Sheets. The file menu is pretty much the same, except that you have the availability to import in sheets. And so we're going to talk about the display screen and then get started working in this application. So let's focus on the upper right. The first thing you'll see is an arrow icon and that's when you hover over it, it's just letting you know that this new file has not been saved yet. The next icon over is to open comment history, and you'll learn about that later in the course. You have the ability to join a call here, or if you're in a meeting, you can present this tab to the call. So you can share your screen from this icon here. If I do the drop down next to that icon, you can start a new meeting or use a meeting code to join a meeting. Then you have your share icon. When I hover over that, it tells me that this blank sheet is private to only me. And then I have my account information. Now you'll notice on the right side, you have this sidebar and this allows you to gain access to other apps. So you have calendar, you have keep, which is a note taking app. You have tasks, you have contacts and you have Google Maps there. The plus sign will allow you to get some add-ons. And all the way at the bottom, you have a right pointing arrow where you can hide that side panel if you're not using it. And then the left pointing arrow, you can show it again. I'm gonna go ahead and keep mine hidden for now. So everything at the top is pretty much the same. Again, there'll be differences on your menu options and on your toolbar, but underneath your toolbar to the left, it currently says E4. That's like the name box. It lets you know what cell is active right now. And I happen to be on cell E4. There's other uses for the name box. To the right of the name box, it's kind of set up the same as Microsoft Excel. So this wide blank area here is your formula bar. Then you have your spreadsheet. You have your column headings, your ABCs. You have your row headings, your one, two, threes. And at the very bottom, you have a plus sign that you can use to add a sheet. So if you want another sheet, by default, when you go in, it gives you one blank sheet. You can use the plus sign to add more sheets. And next to that, there is a lined icon that says all sheets, and it's just showing you sheet one, which is the only one we have 
in this file at this time. And then to the right side, down at the bottom, to the right of your sheet one tab, all the way to the right, you will see another icon. And when you hover over that one, it will say open explore. I think this might be a business workspace feature, but when I click on that, it allows me to get insights instantly. So it says to see answers, formatting and charts in a single click, try adding more data or selecting different cells in your spreadsheet. We don't have anything in the spreadsheet now, so there's nothing there. I'm gonna close that panel. So we're gonna start by inputting some data. The intersection of a column and a row is called a cell. So when I click here, I am now in cell A1, column A, row one. And that's where we want to be. So we're gonna just type in some numbers. I'll show you some cool shortcuts along the way that will work great for training purposes. So I'm gonna type the number 10 and press enter. And then I'm gonna click back on cell A1. And you notice in the lower right-hand corner of the cell, there's a little blue box and it's a handle. When you put your mouse on the handle, it looks like a thin black cross. You're gonna click and hold on the handle and drag down until you get to cell A5 and let go. So cool way to copy something, right? We have the number 10 in A1 and we drag the handle down to A5 and it just repeated, it just copied the number 10. Now I'm gonna have you do control and the letter Z, which is undo. So it gets rid of the duplicate tens and we still have a 10 in A1. Now click on A2 and in cell A2, I'm gonna type the number 20 and press enter. Then I'm gonna select cells A1 and A2. If I point my mouse to the middle of cell A1, click and hold and just drag down one and you'll have both of those cells selected. And right now, if you look at your name box in the upper left corner, right underneath your toolbar, you'll see that it says A1 colon A2, because I have two cells selected. The colon represents a range and it's inclusive. So cell A1, through cell A2, including both of those cells are selected. And so with them selected, you'll notice the bottom most selected cell has the handle. You're gonna put your mouse on the handle and drag down to A5 again. And because we put in two numbers, instead of when we originally dragged the handle on 10 and it just copied 10, it's repeating a series. So it goes 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, which is kind of a cool shortcut to know. We're gonna do control Z again to undo. And in cell A2, you can double click the cell to get into edit mode, or you can go up to the formula bar where you see the contents of the cell. So you see the 20 up in the formula bar. And we're gonna just change that 20 to a 40. And now we're gonna select both of those cells again. And this time we're gonna drag the handle on the 40 cell on A2. Just drag it down to row four. So now it's putting 30 increments of 30 between each number, 10, 40, 70, 100, which is pretty cool. And now we're gonna to go to cell B1 and we're gonna type 130, press enter. And now we're gonna type 180 in B2. And I'm gonna select both of those cells, drag the fill handle down to row four. And now I'm gonna show you another data entry shortcut. So the first thing we wanna do is we wanna insert a new empty row above row one. 
So I can just right click on the row one header and choose insert one row above. So it shifted everything else down. In cell A1, you're gonna type QTR1 and press your tab key this time. When you press tab, it takes you to the right. When you press enter, it takes you down one row and it enters the thing. So we have quarter one and A1. Now we really want quarters one through four. And instead of typing them, I'm gonna click back on A1, grab its handle and drag it over to D1. It will repeat that series for you as well. So less typing for you. In cell E1, you're gonna type regional totals. And now we want a new column to the left of column A. So just like we did with the row, I'm gonna right click on column A's header and choose insert one column left. So now notice regional totals is in F1 because it inserted a new column. It adjusts everything over to the right. In cell A2, you're gonna type east and press enter, west, enter, north, south. And then we're gonna have in A6, quarterly totals. And we're gonna go ahead and name this file. So I'm gonna go up to the rename box that says Untitled Spreadsheet. And I'm gonna name it 2021 Sales by Region. Click away from there. And now I just wanna draw your attention to this arrow that used to say this file has not been saved. Now it says document editors can see your view history for this file. So now I'm going to show you how to create formulas. I'm going to go to cell A20 and every formula or function has to begin with the equal sign so that sheets will know to do a calculation on what you're putting in. So I'm going to type an equal sign in cell A20. And then I'm going to type B2 for the cell reference. So you notice when I type B2, if you look at the actual cell, it, it's shaded. And if you look where we're typing the formula, it has the same color shading on B2. And right above that, it's showing you the value that's in that cell, which is 10. We're gonna type a plus sign, and then we're gonna type B3. It gives B3 a different color, another plus sign, B4, yet another color, and another plus sign, B5. So now at this point that we have the last one in, it's telling us the actual total. 220. So when I press enter, you'll see 220 in cell A20. So you can use your plus sign for addition, your minus sign for subtraction. You can use the asterisk for multiplication and the slash for division when you're doing formulas. I'm going to click on cell A20 and press delete on my keyboard to get rid of that formula. Now, I typically use functions in sheets. Formulas, you're typing a lot, they kind of lend themselves to errors. Functions are like packaged formulas that you can use. And that's what our next topic is going to be. And now we're gonna go to cell B6 and I can show you a little trick here. If you go up to your name box, you can just type B6 and press enter and it will take you to that cell. In B6, we're gonna type our equal sign 
And this time you get something different. If you look underneath where you type the equal sign, it says tab, and then it says sum, and in parentheses, B2 colon B5. And then it gives you the result of that function, which is 220. So when we did the formula, we were too far away from the data in A20 for it to be able to detect it. When you're near the data, in this case, we have numbers right above where we're putting the function, and it's going to be able to detect those cells, and it will give you the default sum function. And that's the function that we want to use. So in order to use it, all we have to do is press our tab key, and it puts that function in for us. And if you look up at your formula bar, you'll see the function, the sum function, and then in parentheses, the arguments, which are B2, the range of B2 through B5. Now, the really cool thing is that we don't have to repeat that function for the other quarters. We can just drag its handle. Now we don't have any data in for quarter three and quarter four, but we're gonna click on B6 and we're gonna drag its handle to the right until we get to E6. And so B6, is still what's showing in the formula bar, and that's the sum of B2 through B5. If we click on C6, we'll see that it adjusted for column C. So that's the sum of C2 through C5. Now we have zeros for quarters three and four, but if we click on the quarter three zero, you'll see it adjusted for column D in the formula bar, and the same with E6, which represents quarter four. Now that means that once we fill in the numbers for quarters three and quarter four, the formula will automatically update to show the sum. Now let's click in cell F2, right under regional totals, and type your equal sign. So sometimes, the farther away you are from numbers, like when we were in A20, it won't give you any function help. But this time it's able to detect that we have numbers to the left of where we are. And so it's gonna select all of the cells to the left, B2 through E2, and it has the sum function, which we can just press our tab key to tab it in. Now let's say, that you click on that cell and you type equal and it doesn't give you the suggestion. You don't have to do this. I'm gonna type equal and then I'm gonna type sum and I'm gonna just, cause it wouldn't have the sum B2 through E2 there if it's not giving you a suggestion. So I'm gonna just select the sum function and then I could click and drag B2 through E2 and then press enter. So that's kind of how that works. I'm gonna select F2 and I'm gonna drag its handle all the way down to F6. So we're seeing our regional totals. So far I have 140 for the East region, so on and so forth. And all of these formulas will update when the quarter three and quarter four numbers are filled in. Sheets has a functions list that you can use. And so let's go to cell G2 and we're gonna go up to the insert menu, hover over function and you'll see at the top, they have the top five functions, sum, average, count, max, min. Then you can get a look at all functions and then they have them broken out into category. And what I tell people is don't worry about the category. If you're looking for a function, just go to all and they're all in alphabetical order. 
Now, in our case, we want to use the average function. I can get it from the all list, or I can, since it's one of the top five, I can get it at the top. I'm going to select average there. So in G2, using the function list, it put in equal average. And notice right underneath it, it's giving you what's called the syntax of the function, which means you have the word average, and then the arguments in parentheses could be value one, comma, value two, comma, or you can click and drag a range to get your argument in. So what we're going to do is we're going to click and drag B2 through E2. We don't want to get the total in there, just B2 through E2 and press enter to get the average. And then on my screen, it pops up suggested autofill, right? So notice it's kind of filled in the average function for G3 through G6. And I want to keep that autofill so I don't have to drag the handle. So I'm going to do the check mark on that. And then it puts those numbers in pretty permanently. And I decided we don't want it in row six. So that last one, I'm going to just click on that 260 and press delete on my keyboard. And then I'm going to go to cell G1 and I'm going to type regional and I'm going to abbreviate averages to A, V, G, S, period. Those are my regional averages. So now what I'd like you to do in cell A7, I'm going to have you type quarterly averages. And then in B7, I'd like you to use the average function to calculate the average of quarter one. And then you can use the handle to drag it over to the other quarters. I'm going to have you kind of do that one on your own. You can pause the video and do it. And when you resume, I'll have it done on my end. When you're done, you'll see the divide by zero error and D and E7, and that's because you can't divide by zero. And it uses division when it's calculating the average. So I'm going to select D and E7 and press delete. Once the numbers get filled in, I can actually drag over the average function then and not have to look at the error on the spreadsheet. And so now if you go to cell G5, the regional average for the South, we're going to drag its handle down to G7 and we're going to go to cell G6 and press delete. So this way we'll get our quarterly averages totals over here as well. It's all going to end up being the same number if you were to fill in the rest of the data. So now what we want to do is we want to select all of the numbers that we have except our averages. So all of the numbers, and I'm even selecting the blanks in quarter three and quarter four. And this way we can format these numbers. We can format numbers from the format menu, which we're going to do. You can also do some number formatting from the toolbar. So on the toolbar, there's a dollar sign where you can format your numbers as currency or as percentages, and then you can decrease or increase the decimal places. And then you have more formats there, that one, two, three button, which has a drop down. So you can see the other types of numeric formats that you have available. So you can use the toolbar. This time we'll use the menu. I'm going to go to format menu, hover over number, and there's that same list from the drop down. Now on that list, I want you, I want you to look at currency and look at the example of where the dollar sign is placed. The dollar sign is placed flush up against 
the left side of the number. And then for accounting, and it's just showing a negative there, but for accounting, the dollar sign is like left justified. I'm going to select accounting because I prefer all of my dollar signs to be left justified. And I'm good with the two decimal, decimal places there, right? And so if you wanted to, you can go back to format number and you can choose currency there and you can see how the dollar signs are flush up against the left edge of the number. For me, it's really, in my situation anyway, it's a personal preference. I prefer accounting. So I'm going to go ahead and change mine back to accounting. So now let's make believe that we just got our quarter three and quarter four numbers. So I'm going to go to cell D2 and let's see, I'm going to type 310 and then in press enter and in D3, I'm going to type 340, just keeping with our trend. I'm going to select those two and drag the handle down to D5. And you'll notice that the total now populated, it's not a zero there. And in cell E2, I'm going to type 430, enter, 460, and then fill those down to E5. So now we have our totals, these totals over here updated as did our averages. And the only thing we have to do now is grab our average function. And I'm going to just select C2 and drag it to D and E2. And then your regional averages are over here to the right as well. When it comes to preview, previewing and printing a sheet, you can use your file menu and choose print at the bottom, or you can just do control and the letter P to open the print settings dialog, where you'll see a preview of your work. On the right side, it lets you know by default, it's going to print the current sheet. If we had cells selected on that sheet, we could choose to print just the selected cells. In my case, I'm on G12 and I want to print the sheet versus just that one cell. Have my paper size, all of that kind of stuff, right? On the right side, you have a formatting dropdown where you can show grid lines or show notes, and we don't have either in ours. You can do the page order, alignment, all of that. And at the very bottom, you have a headers and footers section, which we are going to expand. You have the ability to add page numbers, workbook title, sheet name, current date, current time. We are going to check the box in front of workbook title. And now you can see on your preview that it has the title of the workbook in the upper left-hand corner in like the edit section. At the bottom, we can click on edit custom fields. And so you're seeing that workbook title in the left header section. So that both the header and the footer have left, center, and right sections. And you can come in here and pretty much type anything that you want. In the header center section where it says click to add text, I'm going to just type company name. So any generic company, company name. And in the right header section, I'm going to type accounting department, something like that. In the right footer section, I'm going to click where it says to add text. And you see those icons that pop up when you click in a section. The first one is page number. 
The second one is where I could insert the workbook title or the sheet name. The third one gives me the ability to add a date and select the date format. And the fourth one is for time, if you want that on a header or a footer. We're gonna go to the first one and we're gonna choose page number B, the one that actually has the word page spelled out and then the number. And it puts it in as a code. So if I added more sheets in this file before this sheet, the page number will adjust automatically. And then up in your upper right hand corner, you're going to click on the blue confirm button. And now you're still in print preview and you can see the work that you did from editing custom fields. Now in the upper right hand corner, you have a blue next button and we're going to click it. And this is where it gives you the ability to actually print. You get another preview here and you can change your printer settings and then just click the blue print button in the lower left hand corner. So now I'm going to actually cancel my print screen. I'm not going to physically print this out and we're going to switch our focus to creating a chart. So the first thing I want you to know is when you're creating a chart, you have to tell it the data that you want in the chart. If you don't, it will select data and put it in the chart for you. So we're going to select from a one through E five. So we want our regions, our quarters, and the mythical sales figures in our chart. And we're going to go to the insert menu and click on chart. So it automatically gives us a stacked column chart. It has a chart title of quarter one, quarter two, quarter three, and quarter four. You see that you have your east, west, north, and south as a legend underneath the title. And I can hover over any of those stacked columns. So I'm on the first one for east, the green one. And that's the east quarter four total is being represented there. I'm going to go to the ellipsis button in the upper right corner of the chart. And I'm going to choose edit chart. And that chart editor opens up on the right side again. So we're going to say that we don't want a stacked column chart. That's not the type of chart that we want. That's the default type that it gave us based on what we selected. So we're going to use that chart editor to change some of our setup options. So on the chart editor panel, the first thing that you run into on the setup tab is the chart type. And we're going to do the drop down next to stacked column chart. And it will make suggestions based on the data that you selected, or you can choose a different type of chart on your own. So they're grouped by, there's several different types of line charts. There's area charts, column, bar, pie, scatter, map, other charts. And we're going to go with a suggestion. So if you have the suggested one, a regular column chart, if you don't have it suggested, you can go down to column and pick just the basic column chart. Either way will work. So the only difference between the suggested is it kind of shows your data. The other are just kind of like temporary placeholders. So I'm going to select the column chart under selected, and I like that better. And so it changed everything. It changed the legend to the quarters, right? So the East is all together and there's its quarter one, right? Quarter two is red, so on and so forth. And then we don't want any stacking. The data range is there. 
It shows what's showing on your X axis, right? Which is our um, regions. And then underneath X axis, you have a box that you can check that says aggregate. Now look at the series underneath it and you see how it has quarter one, quarter two, quarter three, quarter four. When you check the aggregate box, it shows you that it's using the sum function and we can do the drop down next to aggregate type if we want in the chart to see a different aggregate, like average, max, median, min, so on and so forth. Down at the bottom, you can switch your rows and columns, and it's using row one as headers. So we've just reviewed the chart editor setup options. Now we're gonna go to the customize tab so we can review the chart editor customize options. And so what the first thing we're going to expand is chart style, right? We can give our chart a background color, change the font, give it a border color, right? And you have some other things you can do in terms of the chart style. So I'm going to start by going to background color and I'm going to use like a pale orange color or a little bit paler than that. Yeah, I'll go with that one. A pale orange color. I'm gonna leave the font the way it is. I'm okay with the font. I'm gonna give my chart a border color, which is gonna be a dark orange color. And underneath that, you'll see that you can reset your layout. So if you do a bunch of changes here and you don't like them, you can reset them. There are three check boxes. I'm gonna check maximize, and you notice how it maximizes the columns in the chart. I'm gonna uncheck maximize. I'm going to check 3D, and I'm gonna leave that. Now these are check boxes, so I could have it maximized and 3D, but I don't want mine maximized. I like it in 3D though. Each column has a 3D effect on it. And then you have your third checkbox there, which is compare mode. Well, go ahead and click on compare mode. And I hover over a bar because of compare mode. So I'm hovering over the quarter four East column and it's showing me the values for the other quarters for the East. That's what happens when you have compare check. I'm gonna go back to my ellipsis and go back to edit chart and back to customize. Gonna expand chart style. So without compare mode, I'm gonna uncheck it, click away from that. And when I click on the east green bar, it's just showing me the quarter four value for east, not the others. So compare mole is really cool. I'm gonna go back to the ellipsis and get back to there, edit chart. And so I like having compare mode on. It just gives me more ability to analyze my data. I'm gonna collapse the chart style section and expand chart and axis titles. And for my chart title, I'm gonna go down and select that text and I'm gonna call it 2021 quarterly sales by region. So it updates the title on the chart. I'm good with the font and its size and its formats and all of that. I might wanna change my title text color I'm gonna make it a really dark orange and then I'll make it bold to stand out a little bit more. Maybe orange is not working there. I might go with a green color that'll stand out. Yeah, and I'll leave it bold. So I just changed the color and made it bold. You have a series section, right? Where you can format line colors and stuff like that. 
you also have the legend section. And in the legend section, it's the same. Where is the position of the legend? It's automatically at the top. I'm going to do the drop down and choose right. So it moved the legend over to the right side of my chart. You have a horizontal axis where you can change the labels and stuff like that. Um, so here it's talking about east, west, north, south. And one of the things you can do with those labels under slant labels where it says auto, I'm going to do 30 degrees. Just adds a little bit more visual interest, I think. Again, this is personal preference stuff here. And then you have options for your vertical axis as well. And under that one, I'm going to check the box. So the vertical axis is where your numbers are on the left side of the chart. I'm going to check the box that says show axis line. And it gives you like a dividing line between the axis and the chart itself. You can also change your minimum and maximum values. So this is the thing. I'm going to just move my chart down a little bit. You know, we use the fill to get these numbers and our highest number is 400 or actually 520, right? And this axis is starting with like zero and going to 600. And that's pretty okay for our range of numbers. Sometimes you might want to change it so it looks better. And then I'm going to collapse that vertical axis section and expand grid lines and ticks. So it starts with the vertical axis here and you, and that's a drop line. So I could do for vertical or horizontal. And then I'm going to scroll down. So you notice you have different options for horizontal versus vertical. Vertical has major spacing types and major steps, minor spacing types, minor counts, major grid lines. If I uncheck that, you'll notice the grid lines disappear. And I'm going to recheck major grid lines. And I can also have minor grid lines, which I'm going to check. So you get those more faded out lines in between the major grid lines. If I scroll down, I can see major ticks. So here on your axis, on your vertical axis, you have those little cross hatches. Those are the major ticks basically next to each value. And then it gives you the ability to change the ticks position and its length. I'm going to leave it on cross. And then you can have minor ticks as well. So you get subsequent ticks on your vertical axis. At this point, you can go ahead and close your chart editor panel by using the X in its upper right hand corner. And we're going to select our chart and we're going to do control C to copy it. And then at the bottom of your screen, you're going to do the plus sign to add a sheet and it gives you sheet two. It puts you in cell a one and you're going to do control V to paste the chart onto this sheet. So, for sheet two, I want to rename the sheet. You'll notice next to sheet two, there's a drop down, right? I could do all of these things, or I can just double click where it says sheet two, and I'm going to do 2021 chart. And then for sheet one, I'm going to rename sheet one to 2021 sales data. And on sheet one, I'm going to select the chart and delete it. So I could have cut and pasted it, but I wanted you to know how to delete a chart as well. I'm going to go to our 2021 chart sheet and show you something else. 
I'm going to select the chart and then go to its ellipsis in the upper right. And from here, I could have moved the chart to its own sheet or made a copy of the chart as well. So I'm just so used to doing control C, control V or control X, control V that I do it that way. But you do have built in on that side menu, the ability to copy the chart or move it to its own sheet. And I'm going to go back to 2021 sales data tab so that now we can work with pivot tables. And so what we're going to do again, just like with a chart, we're going to select the data that we want in the pivot table. And so we are going to select from a one to E five, and we're going to go to the insert menu and we're going to choose pivot table. So, in the create pivot table dialog, it's confirming the sheet that you're on and the range that you have selected. And if you needed to change that, you could, you could go over here and select the data range. And we want the pivot table to be on a new sheet. So we're going to go ahead and click create. So pivot tables allow you to analyze your data because you have the ability to pivot your data in a multitude of ways. For example, you could switch columns and rows. You can add and remove fields, so on and so forth. So what we're going to do is over here on the right in your pivot table editor, you can see that it's showing, like I said, you see in the range there, and then you have suggested to add rows, columns, values, and filters if necessary. To the right, it's showing you what is in column A, right? Which is our quarter information. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna click on the add button next to rows and we're going to choose column A. So now we're seeing our regions as rows. Each region is in a row in our pivot table. Now you'll notice here that it's in ascending order, right? By alphabet. So east, north, south, and west. And we can do the drop down next to ascending and your only other choice is descending there. To the right of that, you have it sorted by that column, right? And then it shows show totals. So we have, that's why we have that grand total in row six on our, where our pivot table is being built. And by the way, if you close the pivot table editor, which we're going to do by using the X in its upper right hand corner, you can get it back by clicking that edit icon that's right underneath your pivot table. On our editor, we're going to add to values and we're going to select quarter one and we're going to leave it as a default. We'll talk more about that in a moment. Go ahead, go back to add values, quarter two. And notice as your pivot table is being built, you're seeing the sum of quarter one, the sum of quarter two. We're gonna go ahead and add values again. And we're gonna do quarter three. And we might as well add quarter four. And you notice next to values as it's adding them as columns, our other choice is to add the values as rows. We're going to leave them as columns. And so if we look in our editor, it's summarizing by sum and it's show as default. You can show as a percent of the row, percent of a column or percent of grand total. We're going to leave it as default for all of those values. And now we don't want it to say sum of quarter one, sum of quarter two. We just want it to say quarter one, quarter two. I'm going to click on sum of quarter one in cell B1 and go up to the formula bar and just get rid of sum of. 
And I'd like you to do the same for the other quarters. And we can go ahead and close that pivot table editor window. And there you have your pivot table. Now I'm going to go back to edit for just one more moment. And just to point out that you have the ability to add filters at the bottom as well. We're not going to do that. I'm going to close the editor window. So basically to pivot in the pivot table, you can swap your values to show in rows and your regions to show in columns. If we had more fields we were dealing with, we can add and remove other fields to our pivot table so we can look at the data in a host of different ways. And now you're going to learn how to create and use name ranges. But first, when we created the pivot table and we said to put it on a new sheet, it named the sheet tab pivot table one. I'm going to double click that and just type 2021 sales pivot. And then I'm going to go back to the 2021 sales data sheet tab. So what is a named range and why would you want to use one? So named ranges make it easier to navigate to certain cells in your data set. And they can also make formulas and functions easier to understand. So let's start by doing this. Click on cell F2 where we have our East regional total. And when you look at the formula bar, it says sum of B2 through E2. It would be clearer if it said the sum of the East. And again, earlier, I showed you how you can use the name box, which tells you what cell you're currently on to navigate to a different cell. So I can click in the name box, and I can type A2 and press enter, and it will take me to that cell. There are a couple of ways that you can define a named range. I'm going to show you what I call the easy way first or the quick way first. And what we're going to do is we are going to select B2 through E2. We're going to go to the name box. And when you click in there, it will select that range and you're going to type East and press enter. So now if you click away from that and you select B2 through E2, it now says East in the name box as opposed to B2 colon E2. Now, the other thing is I can click on any blank cell anywhere, go to my name box, drop down arrow and choose East and it will find and select those cells. So that's one way of creating a named range. Um, we'll deal with the formula issue separately, but for right now you learned how to name one range. Now, Another way that we can name a range, instead of using the name box, go ahead and select B3 through E3. Right click anywhere within your selection. And at the very bottom of this list, you're going to hover over view more cell actions and you're going to choose define named range. So it opens up a named ranges panel on the right. And we're going to call this one West. And so underneath, you'll see the other named range that we completed by using the name boxes on this list. But B3 through E3 is West. And we're going to be choosing Done. Now from here, I can add a range as well from that panel on the right. And this one... We're going to name it first. We're going to call it North. And then right underneath it, it's still 
using B3 through E3. To the right of that, you're going to choose select data range and you're going to go and select on your spreadsheet B4 through E4 and notice it updates over here on the right. And then you say, okay. Go ahead and create the named range for the South region on your own. You can pause the video to do so. So I have my ranges in East, North, South, and West. It will put them in alphabetical order on that named ranges panel. And I'm gonna go ahead and close that panel. And now let's go to cell F2 and just press delete. Type equal. And then I'm going to type the word sum. And I see the sum by itself, the sum function by itself on the list, right? So I'm going to click it on the list to get that function in. Now it's still giving me a hint. You can see the list where it has B2 through E2, but this time I'm going to start typing east. And your named ranges will show up on this function list as well. When I hover over east, it lets me know that it's on the 2021 sheet tab and it sells B2 through E2. So I'm going to just click on east and press enter. So now when I click on cell F2 and I look at the formula bar, it says sum of east, which is a lot clearer than B2 colon E2. And you can change your other regional totals by referencing the named range. So I'm going to click on F3 and this one I'm going to do a little bit differently. I'm going to go up to the formula bar and just select B3 through E3. And I'm going to just start typing West and it pops up on the list and I can tab that in and press enter. So I have my East and my West sums. Go ahead and on your own, do North and South edit those functions. So named ranges make it easier to navigate to specific cells as well as make functions and formulas a bit easier to understand. So our final lesson in this module is protecting sheets and ranges. So we're going to start by protecting a range. I want to select all of my data here on the 2021 sales data tab. And then I'm going to right click on my data, go down to view more cell actions and over on the right, choose protect range, which is the same place you'll go to protect the sheet. We're starting with the range. So I can enter a description for this range and I'm going to say all 2021 sales data is my description. It's showing me the cells that I have selected. And then I can go to set permissions. So range editing positions. When you protect the range, it's normally because you want to restrict who can edit the range, right? Your only other choice is just show a warning when editing this range. So re right now, only I can edit this range. If I do the drop down next to only you, I can do custom or copy permissions from another range. I'm going to select custom. So I can edit it. And down at the bottom, I'm going to add my alter ego self as someone else who can edit this range. And I'm going to choose done. So now it's giving me this pop-up that someone needs access to this. So I'll go ahead and share. So the thing is, when you protect a range or a sheet, the content cannot be changed, but 
It can be printed, copied, pasted, imported, and exported, right? So you only want to make sure you're sharing this with trusted people. Protecting the range is not like the best security measure that you can use. So because I'm myself and I'm, and, and this is not shared with somebody else, I can change stuff, but other people that would come in, if they try to type on any of the cells that we had to select it, it will not allow them to do that. So only myself and alter ego can edit this data. I'm going to right click on any cell, go back to view more cell actions and back to protect range. And this time I'm going to go to the sheet tab, right? So when you go to protect the sheet, it's the same thing. No one can change anything. Let's go to our 2021 sales pivot sheet. We'll do this one. Our 2021 sales pivot sheet and here on the, on the protected sheets and ranges panel, I'm going to change it from 2021 sales data to 2021 sales pivot. So same thing. No one will be able to change anything, but they can print, copy, paste, so on and so forth. For a sheet, you can say, accept certain cells. So there are certain cells that you're letting people change and the rest of the sheet, they can't change anything. So I'm not going to check that box. I'm going to choose set permissions. And I have the same permissions that I've used before. So my alter ego, and I'm going to do done. So protecting a sheet or protecting a range, you're using the same process. It just depends on what tab that you're on. And then I'm going to go to my 2021 sales data sheet. And I'm going to click on the protected sheets and ranges box. I'm going to click where it says all 2021 sales data. That's what the description I put in can edit. And I'm going to go to change permissions and I'm going to uncheck alter ego and choose done. So now only you can edit this range and I'll do done on that panel. And that's how you protect sheets and ranges in sheets. We started module four using Google Sheets by going over the Sheets display screen, and then we started inputting data. We moved on to creating formulas and working with functions, and we actually worked with the Google Sheets function list as well. You learned how to format numbers and how to preview and print a sheet. And then we switched our focus and we created a chart. We then worked with the chart editor setup options and the chart editor customize options. We moved on to working with pivot tables. Then we created and used named ranges and ended this module by learning how to protect sheets and ranges. We'll go through eight lessons in module five when we begin using Google Docs. As usual, we'll understand its display screen and you'll learn how to change the view of a document. We'll be inserting an image and page numbers into a document and then move on to working with styles, using the document outline, collaborating with suggesting mode, and end by working with comments. I'm back in Drive, and from here, we're gonna start our deeper dive into Google Docs. So I'm gonna use the new button on the left, hover over Google Docs, and choose blank document. The Docs display screen has, of course, your rename box where you have untitled document, the ability to get to the Docs home screen, which you've seen before. 
And it also has the menu bar and the toolbar, which we used a little bit earlier. In addition, it has the same icons in the upper right hand corner that you saw in sheets. Because it's docs, you know, it doesn't have the column headers and the row numbers or sheet tabs at the bottom. But on the left side, it has an icon that when you hover over it, it says show document outline. And you can select that now. And then to collapse it, you can use the left arrow button. And you do have a ruler. You have two rulers actually. You have one right underneath the toolbar and you have another one on the far left of your screen. So that we have some data, we're going to each type two short paragraphs and make them about two of your favorite things. It could be two foods that you love, two hobbies that you have. So, I'm going to type mine and you can pause the video, type two short paragraphs on your own, and then you can resume. I chose to go with two of my favorite hobbies. And so now you can see how we can change the view of a document. We're gonna go up to the view menu and I wanna cover this menu in its entirety, However, we'll start at the top and hover over mode. You can see by default, you're in editing view, the top choice, that's the default choice. So you're able to edit the document directly. Another mode is suggesting mode. Your edits will become suggestions which can be accepted or rejected by the owner of the document. And you'll see that later in this module. And then the viewing mode will allow you to read or print the final document. So we're in editing mode. We're gonna skip suggesting mode for right now and click on viewing mode. So it gets rid of the toolbar at the top, the rulers are gone, stuff like that. And you can go back to view, hover over mode and go back to editing. It's one way of doing it. Now, the other thing I'll mention here about switching modes is you can also do it from the right side of the toolbar. So there's an icon that has a pencil on it and you can do the drop down next to it and you can see you're back in editing mode and each different mode has a different icon. So you can always look over there if you're unsure of what mode you might be in. Let's go back to the view menu. So show print layout, you won't be able to see this right now unless we add a second page to this document. So let's temporarily do that. I'm gonna just click away from the view menu and underneath my last paragraph, I'm gonna hold down my control key and press enter. So now I have two pages and I'm on the second page and you can see the edges of the page. So that's what print layout looks like. It's actually showing you what the document would look like if it was printed versus this. Let's go back to view and uncheck show print layout. And now you have what's known as continuous. So I'm seeing the dividing line between the pages, but I'm not seeing the space between each page. And I'm gonna use my backspace key to get rid of that second page. So the line disappears. And I'm back to view. I'm gonna show print layout again and go back to view. So if you don't wanna see the rulers, you can uncheck show ruler. Show outline 
if I uncheck that, that little icon that was on the left disappears. I'm going to go back to view and check show outline again and then collapse it. You also have an equation toolbar that you can show if you need to do any equations in docs, you have this new equation toolbar that shows up underneath your regular toolbar. I'm going to go back to view and turn that off. And if you're working with a large document, you might want to break it into sections for a variety of reasons. And if you need to do so, you can find on the view menu, show section breaks. Your last option there is full screen. So like I said, we'll circle back around to suggesting mode a little later in this module. Now we're going to add some images to our documents. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to click at the end of the first paragraph and press enter twice. And then I'm going to go up to the insert menu, hover over image, and you can see your choices. You can upload from your computer. You can search the web. You can go to images on drive in photos. You can do it by URL and you can get images from a camera here as well. Um, so we're going to do search the web. They have some really good Google images that you can use and it opens on the right side and it's in the search box. And for myself, because my first hobby is that I love to garden, I'm going to type in garden. And you can type in something that correlates to whatever your first paragraph is about. And so when I click on garden in the search results, I get all kinds of images, some of which are like of my dream gardens, but I'm going to find an image that I kind of like select it, And at the bottom right, click on the blue insert button. So I have a picture of someone else's garden underneath my first paragraph. I'm going to click it underneath my second paragraph. I already had space down there and I am going to find an image, another image off of the web that um, correlates to that paragraph. And you can do the same and pause the video while you're doing it. So my second image created a, another page. It didn't fit on the first page. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go up to my first image and I'm going to just click on it to select it. And so you'll notice on the bottom left corner, there are a series of icons now and they correspond to how the image works with any text on the screen. And so if you hover over the first one, which is the default, it's in line with the text. You could have the text wrap around the image, break the text behind the text or in front of text. We don't need to change that option to the right of that. You have your image options ellipsis. And we're going to select that and choose size and rotation. So I want to change the size of both images, trying to get both of them to fit on the same page. If you notice on the right panel, the width is 6.5 and the height is four inches. I'm going to change the height. I'm going to just try this. I'm going to change the height to two inches. And then I'll see how it looks when it's three inches and that might work. So now I'm going to do the same thing by going down and selecting my second image and notice that pane, that panel stays open and I'm going to change that height to three as well. And that's enough to get it on the same page. 
So we have two paragraphs and two images that co correspond to our paragraphs. I'm going to name my document, my favorite hobbies, and you can name yours whatever favorite things that you listed, my favorite foods or whatever it may be. And I'm gonna go ahead and close image options panel on the right. Now we're gonna move on to inserting page numbers in our document. And I'm gonna to go to the insert menu for this as well. And almost toward the bottom, you'll see page numbers. And when you hover over it, you'll see four icons. Well, the two on the left show the page numbers on both the first page and any subsequent pages. The top left one is if you have the page numbers in the upper right corner, and the lower left one is if you have them in the lower right corner. On the right side, the top one is when you don't have a page number on the first page, but you have them on subsequent pages, and it's in the upper right, and the lower one is the same, but it will be in the lower right. And then you have more options and a page count, and we'll work through this menu. So the first one we're gonna do is we'll select the first one on the left-hand side of those icons. And you can see at the top of your document, the header pane is expanded, and you see the page number in the upper right-hand corner. From there, in the header section, you can choose different first page or not, which means don't put one on the first page or put something different on the first page. And then you have your options drop down where you can format the header, get back to page numbers or remove it. We're gonna choose remove header for now. We're gonna go back to insert page numbers and this time we're just gonna go directly to more options. So we're gonna say we want the numbers to be in the footer. We will show them on the first page and we're gonna start at number one and we'll apply. So it opened the footer panel and so, you know, it's the same thing as choosing a preset, but I wanna show you um, everything that happens here on that menu. Now in your footer, after the number one that's down there, you're gonna type a space and the word of and another space. And we're gonna go back to insert page numbers and this time at the bottom, we're gonna choose page count. So now it'll be one of one. And when we add another page, it'll be two of two, that type of thing. And you can just click on any blank space on your document to get out of that footer section. So we worked with a style earlier in the course and we're gonna do so again for a particular reason. When you apply styles in your document, those styles feed your outline, your document outline. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna click in front of the first paragraph, press enter, and then my up arrow to get above it. And I'm gonna type the name of my first favorite hobby. So I'm gonna just type gardening. And then I'm gonna just select the word gardening and you can double click a word to select it. And by the way, you can triple click a paragraph to select it. So I just want the word. And from the toolbar, where it says normal text, that's your style, your current style. I'm gonna do the drop down, and I am going to choose heading two, and you can click directly on it to apply it. 
I'm going to click right in front of my second paragraph and repeat the process. And you want the same style for this paragraph. Now I'm going to use control home to get back to the very top of my document. I'm going to press enter and then up arrow. And I'm going to just type the same thing that I named my file, my favorite hobbies. And so since I put it above gardening, it has the heading to style applied to it, but I want it to be a different style. So I'm going to just go to my style drop down. And for this one, I'll choose title. Now that we have our styles in our document, we can view our document outline over on the left. So you'll notice that all of your styles are what make up your outline. Outlines are really helpful when you're working with a large document because you can use it to navigate to different sections of the document based on your styles. So if I click on music, it takes me to that section of my document. And I notice my picture dropped down to a second page because of my heading again. If I click on gardening, it takes me there. And then my favorite hobbies is at the top. Now I may not want this, the title of the document in my outline. So if I want to, I can use the X to the right of my favorite hobbies and remove it from the outline. And conversely, if I wanted to re-add it to the outline, I could just right click anywhere within it and choose add to document outline. And it puts it back in its same position. And this is where you can also put in a summary of your document, a brief description, if you will. I'm going to click the plus sign to add a summary. And I'm going to say, this is a list of my favorite hobbies, something like that. And I can click away from it and it lets you know that the summary is saved. Now I can collapse that panel on the left again until I need it. So I said we would get to working with suggesting mode later in this module. So remember your modes button is right under your share button on the toolbar, but I'm not going to put this document in suggesting mode at this time. I want to really be able to demonstrate this feature. So the first thing I want to do is I want to share this document with my alter ego. So I'm going to give alter ego editor permissions, but just so you know, if I give them commenter permissions, then when they open the document, it will already be in suggesting mode but I'm going to leave it on editor and I'm going to just send, I'm not even going to notify. I'm just going to send or share. So now I'm going to switch over to my alter ego account. I'm going to leave this account open and this document open in this account. I am going to actually scroll to the second page where my picture ended again. And then I'm going to switch over to my other account. And in my alter ego account, I can see I'm still in my drive shared with me area and that document pops up. So I'm going to just open that document by double clicking it. So it lets me know who I'm currently signed in as. I'm going to click OK. I'm in as alter. I am going to collapse the outline on the left. And what I'm going to do is I am going to go up to my mode icon on the toolbar and change it to suggesting. 
So I'm going to scroll down in the document. And what I want to do is I want to make sure both of these pictures fit on the same page. So I'm going to select the first one and I'm going to go to its image options button, size and rotation. And I'm going to make the height 2.5. And I'm going to go down to the second image and do the same and see if that places it on the same page. Yes, it does. So I have one page for that. Now close image options panel for a moment and you can see what I've done here, right? So I don't want to accept this suggestion because I'm not the owner of this document and that would be the check mark. So every time I make a change, I'll see a box like this. What I want to do is let Trish know that I've made an edit. So I'm going to use the at symbol there and it brings up Trish and that's mentioning that person. And this is where it gets a little confusing. It's really, to me, it should be a send button, but it's reply that I have to click. And then I'm going to go down to the next click on it. And I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to mention Trish and choose reply. And now the other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to click after that second picture and press enter. So it gives me a new page and a new opportunity to type something else. So what I'm going to do here, I'm going to make believe that alter is Trish's assistant and Trish has asked her to type up the information about Trish's third hobby. And so I'm going to do that. You, you're going to add another hobby or food or whatever your favorite thing was, another paragraph and a supporting image. And then you can resume the video. So on my end, I gave it my heading two style for reading, typed a paragraph and then inserted a picture, which I changed the size of. I mentioned Trish for everything that I did. Now these are just suggestions and they show an alters document, but I'm going to switch back over to Trish. And when I do, it's automatically showing me all of alters information. And this is where I, as the owner can say that I want, I can accept or reject these changes. And so I'm going to go down and I'm going to just do the check marks for everything to accept the suggestions rather. And now in my version of the document, it's the same as the suggestions, what I had originally and the suggestions that alter made using suggesting mode. Pretty cool. So something else I want to show you here. If you look up in the upper right hand corner, you'll see I'm in as Trish. I have a blue number one up there. And when I hover over it, it says open comment history. So when I do that, I can see all the suggesting comments that I received from alter ego. I can go to it's more options button and get a link to this comment is basically what I could do there. And so if I hadn't gone through and done the check marks, all of these would still be considered open, right? When I was paused, I did a suggestion and it, I messed it up. So I rejected it, but Everything else is saying that the suggestion was accepted, that Alter did. Now up at the top, there's a drop down next to all. So if I had any open 
things that I haven't reviewed to accept, they would show under open. I'm going to just go back to all. Now there's a couple of ways that you can use comments other than in suggesting mode. I'm going to click away from that. The way that I normally use to start a comment, you'll notice if you put your mouse on the right border of your page, as you move it up and down, you'll see the same three icons. The top one is to add a comment. The second one is to add an emoji reaction. And the third one puts you in suggesting mode, right? So I'm going to be as close to this picture of a garden as I can be. And I'm going to do the plus sign next to add comment. So I can have a comment for myself. I can add others to comments, right? By using the mention, the at symbol to mention them, right? I'm going to just do a comment to myself and it's going to be try to find a garden pick that looks more like mine. And I'm going to choose comment. So that's there for me to see. If I hover over its check mark, it says mark as resolved and hide this discussion. If I go to its more options, I can edit it, delete it, or get a link to this comment. I'm going to choose edit. And I'm going to click at the beginning of the comment and I'm going to mention alter ego and I'm going to change my sentence and say, would you please try to find a garden pick that looks more like mine. And I'm going to choose save. So I switch back over to alter ego and you can see the comment because I was mentioned in it. And would you please try to find a garden pick, blah, blah, blah. And I'm going to click on that comment and reply. Well, actually I'm going to use one of the presets underneath. We'll do and then I'll put by Tuesday and reply. And so I look up and I see my notification that I have a new comment. I go to open my comment history. Now I can see it on the screen there quite well as well. I can open it in comment history as well. And so for these types of comments, I have the ability to edit, delete, resolve, or get a link. The ones that were suggestions, I just get resolve and get a link to this comment. But a good way of communicating back and forth with a document. So Alter says that she'll find this picture and get it done by Tuesday. Tuesday, she'll find a picture and go into suggesting mode. And then I'll get that notification and accept or reject whatever photo she chooses. In this module, we got a better understanding of Google Docs. We started by reviewing its display screen. We typed a couple of paragraphs and then we went through the different views that you have in a document. We learned how to insert images and resize them. We moved on to inserting page numbers and customizing them. And then we worked with styles, which we then saw populated our document outline, which can be used in long documents for navigational purposes or even shorter documents. And then we moved on to collaborating with suggesting mode. You saw that from both sides of the equation. We shared the document, went to the other user. They went into suggesting mode, made some changes, which were accepted by the owner. And we ended up working with comments. In module six, we'll explore Google Slides over nine lessons. We'll start as usual by understanding its display screen, learning how to change the view of a presentation, 
We'll enter text in a slide, add an image to a slide, and then you'll learn how to add, delete, and reorder slides. We'll make our presentation more visually appealing by applying a theme in lesson six, and we'll increase audience engagement in lesson seven by adding transitions and animations. In lesson eight, we'll focus on delivering a presentation and we'll end by using presenter view and audience tools. If I'm working in Google Docs and I want to go to Google Slides, I can just go to Docs Home and that's where you'll see the apps menu in the upper right. So I'm going to use the apps menu and this time we're going to select slides. We're going to select the blank presentation template. Just like docs and sheets, we have our untitled presentation in the upper left corner, our rename box. We can star this if we wanted to show in the star area of drive and that's you star things that are important to you. It does have a menu bar, although some of the options are a little bit different here, like you have a slide menu. And it has a toolbar, which is somewhat different from what you've seen previously. All of these things adjust, the menu bar and the toolbars adjust depending on the application. The upper right side of the screen you still have your arrow that says this new file has not been saved yet. You have your comment history, Google Meet, and then here you have slideshow. You can start a slideshow right from here or from the menu. You have sharing your account as usual, and then you have that sidebar with some other apps, and I'm gonna go to the bottom of that and collapse that panel. On the right side, when you go into a blank template, it gives you a themes panel on the right, and we're gonna close that for now, just to gain some more working space. Similar to Docs, you have a ruler at the top and at the left side. This area in the middle of the screen is where you create your slides and you, you fill them in. And on the left side, you have what's known as film strip view. And you'll see how to use that as we go along. At the bottom of the film strip panel, you'll see a couple of icons. The first one, and you'll notice it has a horizontal black line going across the top of it. And that's when you hover over it, it says film strip view. The other icon is grid view. You can go ahead and click on that and it takes you to a different view. Let's go back to film strip view. We'll use grid view later in this module. Right underneath your slide template, you have an area that says click to add speaker notes. When you're doing a presentation, which you'll learn how to deliver a presentation later in this module, you would be able to see speaker notes in what is called presenter view. Your audience won't see them. So you can use speaker notes to have reminders of what you'd like to say while a particular slide is on the screen or other information. If I want to hide the film strip, I can use that left pointing arrow at the bottom and that gains me more working space. And then I can show it again and I'm gonna leave that showing. Now we're gonna start entering text in slides. So when you bring up a new blank presentation, it gives you a slide with a layout known as a title slide. So it says click to add title and click to add subtitle. We're gonna click where it says click to add title. 
and we're going to type workspace collaboration. And then we'll click where it says click to add subtitle. And I'm going to type presented by colon and then my name for and then learn it. And then I can click away from that. And so I have a slide, one slide in a presentation at this point. Now we want another slide. So I'm going to go to the slide menu and choose new slide. And you see the shortcut key for that is control M. I'm going to just click on new slide. And this time it gives you a layout that's different than the one we just saw. This is called a title and body layout. So when you use control M or new slide, that's the layout you're going to get. And it will work for us in this example. So I'm going to click where it says click to add title. And the title is going to be modules one dash four topics. And notice the title on this type of a layout is in smaller font than the previous one. On the second box where it says click to add text, I'm going to click there. And this is the body portion of the layout. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go up to the toolbar and I'm going to select the numbered list. So it gives me the number one and I'm going to type using Google drive, press enter. You'll get the number two collaborating. And notice it gives me a suggestion collaborating with, well, I don't want with, but I'm going to press tab anyway to select that. And it's going to be collaborating in Google drive, enter working with common features. And the last one is using Google sheets. And these are the topics for this particular course. Now at this point, we want another slide with the same exact layout as our current slide and also with a numbered list on the bottom portion. So instead of using new slide, what you can do and what I usually do is in the film strip on the left, I'm going to right click on slide two and I'm going to choose duplicate slide. So now I'm on slide three, which is exactly like slide two on slide three. I'm going to change the title. So from modules one through four, it's going to be five dash eight. And then for the numbered list for the first item, do control a to select everything that's in there and press delete on your keyboard. Now it leaves you with the number one. We want these numbers to be five through eight. So we're going to fix that first and then we'll put in the other four topics. And we're going to do that by going to the format menu, hover over bullets and numbering, hover over list options and choose restart numbering. And we're going to type in the number five and press enter or click. Okay. So now we're ready to type the topic for module five, which is using Google docs. And six is going to be using Google slides. So you can see where we are in the overall course. We have using Google forms and last but not least using Google meet. And you can click anywhere outside of that box 
If you click on a blank area of the slide, then nothing is selected. Let's talk about changing the view of a presentation now. So slideshow is a view and you know you have your slideshow button in the upper right corner. And if you click directly on the button, it will load the slideshow and it will display the slide that you're currently on in your presentation. You can press escape to get out of the slideshow. If we want to start the slideshow from the first slide, we can go to the slideshow drop down arrow and choose start from beginning. And it gives you the shortcut key combination for that control shift F5. So when I click on that, it will load it with the first slide and it's set so that every time I click, it will display the next slide. When I'm on the last one, I can just press escape to exit the slideshow. And now let's go to the view menu, see what options we have there. Well, you have your slideshow on there and that shortcut key is for start the show, whatever slide you're on. Motion and theme builder, we will circle around to later in this module. Grid view, and you see that it's on the view menu. Also, you have that icon below your film strip. And let's go ahead and select grid view. Grid view is another way of looking at your slide presentation. So you're seeing kind of like all of the little mini slides on the same screen at the same time. This is a good view and we'll use it later. It's a really good view for reordering slides. And if I want to get out of this view, I'm gonna use the film strip icon in the lower left-hand corner to go back to the default view. Let's go back to the view menu. If you don't want to see the rulers, you can uncheck show ruler. If you hover over guides on the right side, you can select show guides. And so it kind of segments your slide. So if you were going to add more content, it gives you a framework or a structure to work in. Let's go back to view. And then you have snap to when you're placing items on a slide, it will kind of, when you're near a guide in this case, it will kind of make it snap to that area. You'll feel a little tug and it just kind of takes it where it needs to be in that area. The reason why we're seeing speaker notes at the bottom is for this next option. It's showing the film strip. And if we have any comments, they would show as well. And then you have the ability to zoom and the ability to view it in full screen and you can select full screen. So everything is hidden except the slide that you're on. And it tells you at the top that you can press escape to go back to your regular view. And then go ahead and click on your first slide. We're gonna add an image to this slide and we're gonna use the Learn It logo that we've already uploaded to Google Drive. We're gonna to go to the Insert menu, hover over Image, and choose Drive. And the only image I have in Drive, I believe, is that Learn It logo, and that's the image that I wanna use. So, there's a couple of different ways that I can get this image onto the slide and which way you choose depends on what happens next. Now, the first way I'm going to show you is the way I would do it if I had multiple images in my drive that I wanted to add somewhere in this presentation. And that would be if I click and hold on the Learn It logo and drag it and drop it in the lower left-hand corner of the slide. 
when I use drag and drop, the panel on the right stays open. And so I'm going to do control Z to undo that. And I'll show you the second way. This way, I'm going to click on it. And at the bottom, I'm going to choose insert. And it inserts it and it closes the panel. And then I'm going to move it so it's all the way in the lower left hand corner. And I just put my mouse on the border of it so it has the four headed arrow. We're going to be adding more images to different slides a little later in this module. Before we start adding, deleting, and reordering slides, let's go back to our view menu, hover over guides, and uncheck show guides. So now we are going to, in the film strip on the left, we're going to right click on the first slide, choose new slide, and then right click on the new slide, hover over apply layout, and we would like the section header layout here. So it just gives you a title box that you can use as a section header, maybe describing the upcoming section or something like that. And where it says click to add title, we're going to just type modules one dash four. Now we want to insert some images and I'm going to, for some reason I have the format options pane open on the right. I'm going to close that. We're going to insert two images on this slide. We want the logo for Google drive as well as the logo for Google sheets. Those are the two applications that we really focused on in modules one through four. And so from the insert menu, just like we did with the learn it logo, we're going to hover over image and this time search the web. I'm going to type in the search box, Google drive logo, and then select the first one on the list. And I'm going to select the first one that shows up and choose insert. I'm going to click on a blank area of the slide, go back to insert image, search the web. And this time I can just double click the word drive and type sheets. So the Google sheets logo, and I'm going to grab the first one and insert. Now I would want both logos to be the same size and I like the size of the one for drive. So I'm going to first right click on the drive logo, go to format options, and you can see the width and the height 2.02 .02 inches for both for me. I'm going to click on the Google sheets logo and change its width and height to 2.02. .02. And then I'm going to put my mouse in the center of it. So I get the four headed arrow and I'm going to just drag it down to the lower right corner. And you'll see the guides that start showing up as I'm dragging it like that horizontal red line is showing me that they're now aligned by their centers and they're different shapes. So I'm kind of wanting them to be aligned by their bottoms. I'm going to drag the Google drive one down all the way to the bottom. And then I'm going to hold down my control key and click on the Google sheets icon. And so now they're both selected. And I can go to the arrange menu, hover over a line and choose bottom. So they're different shaped logos, but they're now aligned by their bottoms. 
And then we're going to make a duplicate of this slide. And we're going to change the title to 5-8. And I'm going to show you another way of selecting multiple icons. So notice where my mouse pointer is. It's slightly above and to the left of the drive icon, and it's pointing to the left. I'm going to click and hold, and I'm going to drag and draw a box around both icons, and now they're both selected. And I'm going to press delete on my keyboard. So this slide is going to end up having four different icons on it. We'll do the first two together, and then you can do the last two on your own. So we want to grab the logo for docs first. I'm going to just go back to insert image, search the web, change sheets in the search box to docs. And I'm going to grab the first docs logo and insert it. I mean, going to immediately right click on it, go to format options and change its width and height to the same as the previous ones. In my case, it was 2.02 .02 for both measurements. And I'm going to go ahead and drag that icon all the way down into the lower left corner. Click on a blank area of your slide, insert image web. We're going to change docs to slides here and grab the first slides logo, insert it. And I'll let you go ahead and change its size on your own to match the size of the previous one. And when you have the size right, just drag it down to the right of your docs logo. So you have two more to insert in size, and that would be forms and then meet. And so once you do forms and meet, go ahead and pause the video and get those logos in and sized. Then you can unpause and resume. So don't worry about the spacing or the alignment right now of these icons. We're going to address that momentarily. We should go ahead and rename the file from untitled. When I click in there, workspace collaboration is great as a name. So just want to make sure we do that. And then I'm going to draw a box around all four of those logos. And I'm going to go to the arrange menu. And the first thing I'm going to do is hover over a line and choose bottom. Go back to arrange. And I'm going to hover over distribute and choose horizontally. So you see it gave it equal spacing between each icon. And now let's duplicate that slide that you're on. And then we say, oh my goodness, I did that totally by accident. I don't really need that slide. So in your film strip, you can right click on the duplicated slide and you can choose delete. You could also select the slide and press delete on your keyboard to have the same effect. And if you delete a slide by accident, you can undo the deletion. I'm going to switch to grid view and I'm going to use the handy little icon underneath the film strip to do so. Now you can do it in film strip view as well, but I'm in the habit of when I have to reorder slides of using this view. I feel like I can see more of the slide thumbnails in this view. 
And so what I'm going to do is we want that module five through eight section header with the icons on it to be in between slides four and five. And so I'm going to click and hold on it and I'm going to drag it down. And as I drag it around, you'll see a guideline. And when that guideline, that vertical guideline is between slides four and five, I'm going to let go. So the section header is in the appropriate place in this presentation now. And I can use the button on the lower left to go back to film strip. And like I said, you can do the same thing, move things around in this view. However, let's say you have a slide presentation with 20 slides or 15 slides. You're not going to see all of them here, whereas you'll be able to see more in grid view. But this is just a personal preference. It is not a requirement of the application by any means. To give our presentation more visual appeal, we're going to apply a theme to it. And we're going to do that from the slide menu. And down at the bottom, we're going to choose change theme. And so the themes panel opens on the right side. And there are, you notice at the top, it says in this presentation, right? And I can expand that. So these are themes that are available, different colorations, different fonts, in some cases, even different font colors. And so these are built in themes that you can use. Now, some themes behave in different ways. And it depends on the slide layout, as you'll see. And so what I'm going to do on the right side in themes, I'm going to just select this theme here. It's called paradigm. And I'm just going to select it by clicking on it. Now notice it applied that theme. It's slightly different on a title slide, right? Um, it looks even different on the section header slides with those layouts. And then the title and body slides, if you click on slide three over there, you can see how it made this kind of into two columns and it put the design in the title on the left side. So that's an example of a theme. I'll go back to slide one. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose a different theme. I'm going to choose this one. It's the orange one. It's called Swiss. And so this one, you can see how it looks on the title slide, how it looks on the section header slides. And then it didn't really, it applied some of the graphics, the lines to our title and body slide layouts. And we can almost live with that. However, we would like to have some color on those slides. To do that, we're going to go back to the slide menu. And almost at the bottom this time, we're going to choose edit theme. And you get this whole different view. And at the top of it, it says editing Swiss. That's the name of the theme, right? And it's showing you here that the title and body layout is used on two slides. Because I was on that slide when I came in here, it's on that layout on the left. So you see we have the coloration for these two layouts, but not for this one that's selected on this left pane. And we want to give it some coloration. And so there's a little toolbar and it has background and colors at the end of it. We're going to choose background and we're going to do the color drop down. And I don't want it to be the exact same color, but I want it to be like a pale orangey color. 
And I don't like that one, so I'm going to try this one. I'm actually going to do custom, and then that way I can kind of mix the color a little bit better here. It's going to be more browny than orange. And I'm going to choose OK. I could use an image in the background, or I can reset it to the theme from here. I'm going to do done, and I'm comfortable with that contrast. So if you look at your film strip, you'll see that those two slides, the title and body slides, now have that color. And so I can close this middle panel where we're editing by using its X, and now I'm back in my presentation. And to be honest with you, I'll probably go and change that color. I'm looking at it now and I don't like it. And so I did change it. So the color is consistent. Really, when you're thinking about a presentation, less is more. And you'll see that in upcoming lessons. Transitions are effects that the audience will see when you advance from one slide to another during a presentation. Animations, on the other hand, happen on the slide. We're going to start with transitions. So typically, I will use one transition, the same exact transition, for all of the slides in my presentation, just to keep it very spare. Also, it helps to keep the audience's attention. Imagine you had 50 slides and you use different transitions between them or a mix of different transitions between them. At some point, your audience is gonna start thinking, I wonder what cool thing is going to happen when he or she advances to the next slide instead of paying attention to the content of your presentation. So I'm just gonna use one transition for all slides. And we're gonna do that by right clicking on the first slide in the film strip and choosing transition. And that opens the motion panel on the right. So you notice it says there are no transitions. We're going to do the drop down arrow next to none, and we'll go through a few of these. And we'll choose dissolve. Right underneath that, you will see the speed of the transition. And then you have a button that says apply to all slides. And if you look over in your film strip, to the left of each slide thumbnail, you'll see the motion icon indicating that that slide has a transition applied to it. Now what we can do, I'm gonna just go up and click on the slideshow button. And now when I click or press enter to advance to the next slide, you'll see that the previous slide had the dissolve effect. When I click again, you'll see the same effect. And I'm gonna just press escape to exit the slideshow and click back on the first slide. Let's test a few more transitions. So on the right side, I'm gonna do the drop down next to dissolve. And let's look at cube. And again, you're going to apply to all slides and then click your slideshow button. Go ahead and click and you can see the cube effect. Let's press escape, click on the first slide and we'll try one more. I'm going to go to the drop down and select gallery, apply that one to all slides and play my slideshow. And I think I like the gallery effect. 
So I'm going to press escape, click on the first slide, and we have our transitions. So now we're going to switch our focus to animations. We're going to add animations to the second and fourth slides. So I'm going to go to the second slide. And what I want to do is I want to select both of those logos on the bottom. And this is where we can make a decision. I'm making the decision to animate both of these logos at the same time. You could do them one at a time. And I'll show you that example when we get to slide four. On the right side, we're still using the same motion panel that we use for transitions. And we're going to choose under object animations, add animation. So you'll notice the two separate animations, even though we group them together, the first one will happen when we click. So if we click to advance the slide and then we click again, the drive icon will fade in. And so will the sheets icon because it's set to fade in and it's going to fade in with the previous one. So they'll fade in together is what that is saying. Now, for the first one, the drive fade in, I'm going to do the drop down next to fade in after I expand it. And you can see the other animation effects that are available. So I tend to use no more than two object animations. And in a situation where I'm only doing the animations on two slides, I prefer to use the same animation. And so it's not distracting to the audience. So it defaults to fade in. And I am going to select appear. And so the first one, the drive one, will appear when you click on the slide after the slide has advanced. And then the second one is still with previous, and we're going to leave that one on click. Your other choice there is after previous or with previous. So we're going to leave that one on on click. And for our sheets icon, I'm going to expand it. And I'm going to change it to appear and I'm going to leave it set with previous. I'm going to go to the first slide first and then click on slideshow. And so when I click on this one, it has that gallery transition. And now I'm on the second slide. When I click on this slide, both of those icons appear and we can escape. And let's go to slide four. So since we applied a style, our icons are a little bit too big and we'll go back to slide two. I'll have you do that on your own after we do it on this slide and apply the animations. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to move this title box up a little bit. And by the way, when you have an object selected, you can use your arrow keys on your keyboard to move that object around. And since I moved it away, I am going to then select these four icons at the bottom. I'm going to right click on any one of them and choose format options. So I want to change the height of these because I have them all selected. It's saying the width is 10, but I would like the height to be like 1.50. Well, I'm going to deselect it first and look, I wanted to make sure that each of them were above that white line. That's part of the theme. I'm going to click on the title again, click on the edge of it use my down arrow 
to move it back down. So now that we have the smaller icons, we are going to still select all of them, close the format options pane on the right, and your motion panel is still open. And so we, just like on slide two, we're selecting all of these objects that we wanna animate. We're gonna click on add animation, and this is where we can separate them. So I'm gonna use the same animation for each one. So for the first one, which is docs, I'm gonna expand it. The animation type for this one, I'll try, let's see. Fly in from bottom. And I'd like to do that one on a click. For the next one, which is slides, we're gonna change it to fly in from bottom. And instead of with previous, we're gonna say on click. So until you click, the next icon won't show. So they'll be treated as individual animations. Go ahead and choose the same animation and the same method of animation for the remaining two icons. And let's click on slide three and start our slideshow. So go ahead and click to advance. When you click the first time, you'll get the docs icon. Click again, you get slides. Again, and you're getting forms. Again, and you get meet. And when you click again, it will advance to the next slide and you can press escape. And you can also close the motion panel. Let's go to our first slide. And at the bottom, we're going to click where it says click to add speaker notes. Now, if you put your mouse in the middle of that panel right above there, you'll see three dots. You can actually increase the size of that area and decrease the size of your slide. Depends on how many notes you wanna type in. We're not gonna type in very many. So on this one, I'm gonna type, introduce yourself. Remember the audience doesn't see speaker notes and remember to cover housekeeping issues. And in parentheses, I'll put restrooms, phones, silent, etc. And so this is a note to the presenter, just a reminder of something that you wanna discuss, or you know certain topics that you might wanna delve into for a slide, so you don't have to have a piece of paper, and you'll see how this works. Now you already know how to deliver a presentation, right? Why don't we go ahead and run through our entire slideshow? So we're not seeing our speaker's notes. This would be the screen that your audience would be seeing. And then I'm gonna click, and I've got my nice transition there. I'm gonna click again, and on this slide, we have both logos coming up at the same time based on one click. And we have to go back and resize those. Then I click again, and I advance again, 
And then on this slide, when I click, each icon will show individually. And then I advance again, and I'm at the end of the slideshow. So I can go ahead and press Escape. Now, I've already gone to slide two and resized my icons. I'm going to move my Excel icon over a little bit. So I gave them the height of 1.50, and you can do the same. And now we're going to start using Presenter View and Audience Tools. So once you get your icons adjusted, I'm going to go to the first slide. And I'm going to do the drop down arrow to the right of the slideshow icon. And at the top of the list is Presenter View. So let's go there. So this window. If you're working, you have a, a monitor or a flat screen, or you're projecting the actual slideshow, which is here behind this screen for the audience, this can be on your other monitor. And this way, this is the presenter view window. And so on the left, it shows you how much time has elapsed since you started the slideshow, it lets you know that you're on the first slide and it has a thumbnail of the first slide. Underneath that, it's showing you a thumbnail of the next slide. And again, your audience will never see this. On the right side, you have two tabs. You're on the speaker notes tab. We put a speaker note on slide one and you can see the note there. And you can use the plus sign to zoom in to make your note enlarge so you can view it better if necessary. We didn't put notes on any of the other slides, but this is how you can see them and not the audience members. So what I can do when I'm in presenter view, when I'm ready to advance, I can choose next. And you're seeing in the background, it's showing the slide without the animations on it. But on presenter view, it's showing each animation and it's saying next, right? So if I click on that, then you'll see both icons on the slide for the audience. And now it's showing me the third slide. So I'm going to click next here and you're seeing the transition effect that we used. And I'm going to continue to click next. And so this one, when I do next, I get the docs icon, then I get slides, then I get forms and then I get meet and next. And now I'm on the last slide. So I can, at this point, let's go to the audience tools tab. And I'm going to use this list here to navigate back to slide one. Audience tools allows you to enable audience Q and a, and it's kind of cool how it works. So you may have just a start new button on the right. I'm going to click on start new and it tells me that it's accepting questions from within my organization. And I can do the drop down there and change it to anyone. It has a link there that the audience will see at the top of every slide. And it's an active link. So anyone who is viewing this presentation, in my case, from within my organization, will be able to ask a question by clicking that link. So I accidentally closed my presenter view window. So I'm going to go back to my slideshow dropdown 
and go back into presenter view. And I'm going to go back to the audience tools tab. So this is when I can continue the recent one and it comes up and I can just click on continue and you'll see it places the link at the top of every slide. So anybody within my organization can use the link. And I'm going to do this by just dragging this down, this window down a little bit, and I'm going to click that active link at the top of the slide. So what I can do here is I can just click on my account and sign in as my alter ego and ask a question. So when I'm asking a question, I have the opportunity to ask anonymously or not. I'm going to leave it unchecked and I'm going to just say, do you have to use video in Google meet? And I'm going to submit my question. So it shows my question to me. Now I'm going to switch back to my other tab where I'm running the slideshow. I'm going to press escape. I'm going to go back to the slideshow drop down, presenter view. Audience tools, continue recent, continue. And this is how the question would show for anyone that is viewing this presentation. So Alter Eagle didn't post anonymously, right? Or anything like that. So I'm the presenter and I'm looking at presenter view and this question pops up and when it's an appropriate time during the presentation, I will answer the questions. I'll read the questions out and answer them. So in this module, we created a presentation using Google Slides. We started by reviewing its display screen we learned how to change the view of a presentation, and we did that after we entered text in some slides. We added an image to a slide and moved on to adding, deleting, and reordering slides before applying a theme to make our presentation more visually appealing. And then we added transitions and animations to our presentation. We went through delivering our entire presentation and then ended by using presenter view and audience tools. In module seven, we'll be using Google Forms in six lessons. As usual, we're going to understand the forms display screen, and then we'll create a form, add questions, send a form, link to a spreadsheet, and we'll end up by you learning how to view responses. So I've gone back to the Google homepage. And by the way, when you're using the menu, if you click on search, it will take you to this page. I'm going to use the menu and go almost all the way to the bottom. And that's where you'll find forms. And when we get in there, you're going to click the blank template. Just like other apps that we've used in the upper left hand corner, you can easily get back to the forms homepage. You have your rename box and you have your star if you want to star anything that's important to you. So it goes in the starred folder in drive as well as in your my drive. On the upper right in forms, you have a different set of icons. The first one 
that looks like a palette you can use to customize your theme. The second one that looks like an eyeball will take you into preview mode where you can preview your form. Then you have your undo, redo, and send icons. You also have a more ellipsis. And from there, you can make a copy of a form, get a pre-filled link, print, add collaborators, so on and so forth. Underneath all of that, you're on the questions tab. That's the default tab that you'll be on when you come in. Your questions tab is where you're going to create the questions for your form. You can also add titles and sections to your form, and you'll get an example of sections here um, when we start adding our questions. Then you have the responses tab, which we will visit a little bit later, and you also have a settings tab. So when you use the blank template, it gives you an untitled form header section where you can also put a form description and it gives you one untitled question block. On the right side of your screen, you'll have like a sidebar and it travels with all the questions that you add to your form. So on that sidebar, you have the ability to add a question, to import questions that may exist on other forms you've created, to add a title and description block, to add an image, video, and also a section. And in your lower right-hand corner, you have your question mark where you can seek support and also give feedback. Let's click where it says Untitled Form. And you're going to want to do Control A because that's not, it's placeholder text, but if you don't do Control A and select it, it will continue to stay in there. So we are going to name this form Google Workspace Survey. And the form description is going to be used to decide if our organization will switch to Google Workspace, something like that. Now you notice underneath that you can select any text in either of those two boxes and format it, insert a link. You can even do number formatting and bulleted formatting. And then you can remove the formatting if, if necessary. Now, before we deal with the untitled question, we are going to insert a section. So using the right sidebar, add section is the last icon. We're going to go ahead and click it. And now what we want to do is click on the untitled question. And you'll notice the six dots in the upper center of that question. If you put your mouse on those dots, it will allow you to move the question. We're good with where the question is. If we wanted to move it, we could just slide it up and down by using that arrow. So now we're going to deal with our section, which will make our series of questions a little bit more understandable. So in that untitled section, I'm going to do control A. And I'm going to type, please rate these Google apps by how often you use them. And then in parentheses, I'm going to put one equals don't use semicolon five equals use daily and close the parentheses and put a period. And so with the section, you'll notice the first section is the header. And underneath that now, since we inserted another section, it says after section one, continue to next section. There's a drop down arrow to the right of that. And you can make a different choice here, but we, the default choice is what we want, continue to next section. 
So in section two, we have the section header. You notice it says there the description is optional. And for the section header, it has a more ellipsis to the right. And you can see that you can duplicate the section, move it, delete it, or merge with the above section. We're not going to put in a description. We're going to go down to our first untitled question. And the untitled question, you're simply going to type Gmail. And then notice the answer type over on the right was multiple choice and it automatically switched to short answer. Doesn't really know what we're looking for. We're going to do the drop down arrow next to short answer and we're going to select linear scale. And it defaults to one to five, which is what we want. And we're going to give the one and the five labels that mirror what we put in the parentheses in the section header. So the first label next to the one is going to be don't use. And next to five, we're going to have a label that says use daily. At this point, we have six more apps that we want to put on this form with the same linear scale, same labels and everything. So instead of using the plus sign to add a question on the right sidebar, at the bottom of your Gmail question, you're going to hover over the two pieces of paper and we're going to duplicate that question. And then all we have to change is the name of the app and this will be sheets. We're going to duplicate sheets and it's going to be docs. We're going to duplicate docs and type slides, duplicate slides, type forms. And we have two more and I'm going to have you do them on your own by pausing the video. So you want to duplicate forms and have a question for calendar and another question for contacts. So just to make sure you have them all, it's Gmail, Sheets, Docs, Slides, Forms, Calendar, and Contacts. And notice as I'm scrolling that that sidebar is traveling to the right of every question. And so on the sidebar, we have the Contacts question selected. On the sidebar, we're going to add another new section. And this section is going to be, I'm going to click where it says Untitled Section, do my control A to select that text. And I am going to type, please select any additional apps you currently use. And again, we're not going to put in a description for that. What we're going to do is go over and we're going to add a question using the sidebar. And this question, we want to make it, if you look at the answer type first, it defaults to multiple choice. We're going to do the drop down and we're going to select check boxes so they can have more than one thing selected. The question, we're just going to put apps. And then we're going to click where it says option one. And when you click there, it should select all of that text. And we're going to type chat. I can use my down arrow for it to go down to and select option two for me. And option two is going to be spaces. Option three, meet. Four, keep. Five, tasks, and last but not least, drive. So then we decide to make our section headers bold. So I'm going to just click on that section three of three header, select everything. And I can use control B here, or I can click on the B icon. And I'm going to go up to my section two header 
and do the same thing. And I think the um, title is fine. So the next topic is sending a form, but before I send a form, I like to preview it. So go ahead and click on your eyeball icon in, in the upper right, and you'll see next, it gives you the title block. And then when you do next, it goes to the next section and includes the title block at the top. And so this is our section two, where we're listing the apps and using the linear scale. And then at the bottom, you have back, next, and clear form, although you're not gonna use this to fill out the form. We're gonna choose next, and it takes us to our third and final section about other apps. And I'll show you that preview opened in its own tab, so I'm gonna close the preview tab here and just re-maximize my browser window. So once we preview the form, and this is also not on the outline, but I'm gonna show it to you real quick. You might wanna make it more visually appealing. So we're gonna to go to the paint palette icon to customize the theme. Here you can change your fonts and font sizes. You can add images. I'm just going to change my color. And so the background color as well as the header, the section colors really get the color that I chose. And notice the background is a little bit lighter. I can make that darker if I like. And I'm gonna go ahead and close the theme panel. So now you can go ahead and click on the send button in the upper right corner. And you can send forms via email, which is the default via link, you can get a link to the form and copy it. And then you can send the link via chat or some other mechanism. And you can also embed it on an HTML page. We're gonna keep it on email and I'm gonna send it to my alter ego. I'm also at the bottom gonna include it in the form in an email. I usually check that cause I like to do that. Um, although you don't have to check it. So I'll leave that choice up to you. I'm gonna go ahead and address it. It gives the subject, which is the name of the form and it gives a default message and I'm fine with that. So I'm gonna address it. I can add someone else as an editor of the form in the bottom left if I want to. So when they receive it, they can actually edit it. Otherwise, I'm just mimicking how someone who's responding to it would respond. So I'm gonna go ahead and address this and click send. In my alter email, I see I can just click the link to fill out the form. And it lets me know that it's gonna automatically save my work. I'll just say, okay. So here's, I'm gonna click next and I'm gonna just do some random numbers on this lineal scale here. Random choices. And then when I get to the bottom on this section, I'm gonna go next and fill out the last section and you can do the same. And then you'll have your submit button. So there's a setting that allows respondents to submit another response. And I'd like us to submit another response and mix it up a little bit from your first response. So Alter has submitted two responses. I'm gonna switch back over to my Trish account. So now you'll see at the top of my screen, there's a two, the number two, to the right of my responses tab because I've received two responses to this form. So I'm going to go to the responses tab. At the top, it says two responses. It's on a summary tab. There's also a question tab 
So these are the tab locations I'm talking about. Summary, question, and there is, there is also an individual tab. And above those tabs on the right, you'll see a green icon. And if you hover over it, it says create spreadsheet. And we'll get back to that in a few. It also has an more options. So we'll go over some of these. And this form is accepting responses. And this is a key one. Let's say you're doing this survey and you want to end the survey in two weeks. In two weeks, you can come in and toggle that so the form no longer accepts responses. And then on the summary tab, you're seeing each question and it's showing both of the responses for each of those linear scale questions, right? So you're seeing everything and then it's showing the additional apps responses. And you'll notice to the right of all the responses, you could copy the chart if you'd like and paste it somewhere else as necessary. If you go to the question tab, it's showing the first question, right? So it's showing both responses for Gmail. There's a right arrow you can use to go to the next question, or you can do the drop down next to Gmail and go through the questions that way. And lastly, you have the individual tab. And you'll notice at the top of the individual tab, you can print responses. It's on response one. So it's showing all the questions and all the responses for the first respondent. And back up at the top, I can go to the next response and look at those in the same manner. So you have your summary tab, your question tab, and your individual tab, which can be printed. A really cool feature in forms, and you can do this from any of the responses tabs, is you can link the form to a spreadsheet and the spreadsheet will be stored in Drive and the responses will be in the spreadsheet as they come in. So in order to do that, we're gonna use that green icon in the upper right corner. And when you hover over it, it says create spreadsheet. We're gonna go ahead and click on that and it gives you the ability to create a new spreadsheet or select an existing spreadsheet. So let's cancel out of here for a moment because I realized that we never clicked in our rename box. So let's click in our rename box so we get the Google Workspace survey name up there and then we'll go to the green icon. So instead of saying untitled form now, so it's gonna create a new spreadsheet and it's gonna be named after your form and in parentheses, it will say responses. And we're gonna go ahead and create. So you can see it automatically opens the form. It gives it a timestamp and it's showing you the responses by question. And because this is on Drive, if there are more responses, this spreadsheet will update as well. In this module, we focused on using Google Forms. We started by getting into Forms and understanding the Forms display screen. And then we created the form. We added sections and then questions. And then you learned how to preview your form and we decided to add a theme to it for some more visual appeal. You then learned how to view your form responses in forms and how to link the form to a spreadsheet. And you saw how the spreadsheet is where you could go to view your form responses as well. In our eighth and final module, we'll be using Google Meet over eight lessons. 
We'll start by scheduling a video meeting from Google Calendar. You'll learn how to join a video meeting, and then you'll learn about the Meet display screen. You'll also learn how to present your screen during a meeting, and then how to manage meetings, how to change your audio and video settings, how to start a video meeting both from Gmail and ending with starting a video meeting from Google Meet. So we're gonna get started by scheduling a video meeting from Google Calendar. I'm gonna use the apps menu to get to my calendar. And I'm gonna just go two days out. For me, it would be Friday the 13th. And I am going to double click on any appointment line. And so the first thing I'm gonna do at the top on the left is I'm going to add a title. And this is gonna be called Company Wide Meeting. I'm gonna set this to an all day event that does not repeat. And my scenario for this is I have people in time zones all across the United States. So the meeting will go from eight to 5 p.m. and it will start in the earliest time zone so that's the East Coast and travel across the country until everybody is in the meeting at the same time. Under event details, the first thing you see is add Google Meet video conferencing and I'm gonna click that. It gives me a code. I'm gonna click in add location and I'm gonna type the word remote and you notice it brings up a bunch of stuff called remote all around the country. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just click away from that so it just selects my remote. I'm gonna change my availability to busy on the left. And then in the add description box, I'm gonna type, this is the meeting where we will discuss whether to adopt Google Workspace for our organization. Your input is critical for this decision. Looking forward to picking your brains. On the right side, I'm gonna go ahead and add my alter ego as a guest. Once you add guests here, press enter, and then you'll see them down below. If the guest you're adding is already on the list, when you click there, you can just click on them and they will show down below. So under guest permissions on the right, I'm gonna say that my guests can only see the guest list, not modify the event or invite others. Up at the top, I'm gonna go ahead and click on save. And it asks me if I'd like to send invitation emails to Google Calendar guests, and I'm gonna choose send. So the all day event shows up at the very top of that day. It's not on any specific time slot because it's an all day event. Even without sending an email, this event is already on Alter Ego's calendar as a pending event. I'm gonna switch over now to Alter Ego's email. In Alter's email, I'm gonna just respond to this. I'm gonna just say yes, click the yes button. And if I scroll down and slightly to the right, when I'm ready to join the meeting, I can use this link in the email. Now back on Trisha's calendar, I can double click that company-wide meeting and you can see here, I have an RSVP, right? I can add a note for guests. And you can see down here that two guests, including myself, the organizer, I have two yeses. So it keeps a tally of people responding and I'm gonna just go ahead and save. Now I am going to join the meeting from my calendar. I'm back in my Trish calendar. I'm gonna just double click it to open it up. And now the icon says join with Google Meet. 
I don't have my video. I have my video lid closed. And in that video screen at the bottom, you can turn off your microphone or turn off your camera. And this would be universal for everyone. You also can check your audio and video if necessary. On the right side, of, on the bottom of the video, you see apply visual effects. So I'm gonna go ahead and click on that and it opens up a new pane and it's on the effects tab. And by the way, if you had checked your audio and video, it would be on the audio and video tab. So on the effects tab is a couple of new things there. And then there's a bunch of backgrounds and then filters if I scroll down and then there are styles. So if I wanna apply a different background in my home office and I'm going to go back to the top and I'm gonna click the X in the upper right hand corner. Now on the right side, it's letting me know that no one else is here. I can join now. I'm gonna go ahead and join now. So that was like a preview. And now you're seeing the meeting interface. And on the bottom left, it tells you the time, the name of the meeting. You have a series of icons. This, you can turn off your microphone or you can turn off your camera. You can also turn on captions. A participant can raise their hand to get your attention if you're presenting. Present now gives me the ability to present my screen to everyone in the meeting. Then there's more options where I can open a jam whiteboard. I can change the layout, apply visual effects, some of the stuff that's on the icons there, report a problem, so on and so forth. And then you have the hang up button or leave call when you're ready to leave the call. On the right, you have meeting details information icon. So when I click that, it shows me the details of the meeting. It shows the name, the description, the time, the date and time, the fact that it's located at remote. And then if I needed to copy the joining info really quickly and send it to somebody in a chat, I can get it right from there. And I'm gonna close the meeting details pane. And then to the right of that, it's letting me know that there's only one person in the meeting. It's showing, I can show everyone and you're just seeing me. If I click that icon, I can open up a chat screen that I can send chats to everyone. And by default, people that are in the meeting can also send chat messages. I can close that panel. Usually um, if I'm doing a remote training course with live people in the audience, not a video, then I have the chat on so that people that you know can't speak up or whatever can still participate. Then there's an activities icon where you can get to breakout rooms, polls, record your meetings, whiteboards. And last but not least, there are host controls. And so I'm the host and I am turning on host management. I'm letting everybody in the meetings then share their screens and chat messages, turn on their microphones and turn on their videos. So now Alter is going to join the meeting and Alter is going to join from that join meeting button in the email that she was sent. So the first thing you'll see is someone wants to join this call. As the host, you can remove anyone at any time. I'm going to go ahead and admit, and that's just a setting that I used. And now my screen changes. Alter Ego is not on video. So they just show as the letter A and my video is now in the lower right hand corner. It's the opposite on Alter Ego screen. My video fills up most of the screen and their letter A is in the lower right corner. So at this point, I wanna share my screen. I wanna share that Google Workspace survey form with everybody in the meeting. So I'm gonna go down to my present now icon 
and I'm going to share a tab. So your choice is your entire screen, a window or a tab. I have the form open in a different browser tab. And then I can see the survey there and I'm going to share. And so now I can see, and everybody in the meeting can see this survey form and we can discuss it during the meeting. And then if I want to stop sharing at the top, I can choose stop sharing. Now in the meantime, on alter screen, my shared screen is taking up most of the space. My video is on the top right. I'm gonna choose stop sharing. So now when I look in my lower right corner, first of all, I'm seeing that there are two people in the meeting. And to the right of that, I have a little notification on the chat with everyone. When I open it up, I can see that Alter Ego sent me a chat and I can reply back. Everybody in the meeting would see this. And that's how that works. And I'm going to go ahead and close the in-call messages window. And now we'll just make believe that this meeting is over. So at the bottom, I'm gonna click the hang up, the leave call button. And because I'm the host, I can end the video call for everyone. Um, I'm gonna do that. Otherwise you would just leave the call and everyone can hang up on their own. But in my case, since I'm managing two people in the meeting at the same time, that ended for me. And so it always asks you for a survey and I'm gonna give my feedback and it takes me to Google Meet's home screen. I'm back in Trisha's calendar, and I wanna show you some other things that you can do in terms of managing your meetings. So I'm gonna just double click this company-wide meeting. And again, the link is still active here, right? But what I'm going to do is up at the top, I'm going to select the more actions drop down. So you can print out your meeting details. You can delete a meeting from here. You can duplicate a meeting if you have a similar one coming up, right? You can publish an event. And if you click on that, it gives you a, a block of HTML code. So if you have your website, you can use this code on your site so that visitors can add this event to their calendar, or you can copy the link to the event from that dropdown. And then the only other option you have is to change the owner. So I'm the owner of this, you know, I'm the organizer, therefore the owner, I'm the owner of this meeting, or I could set it up and switch it to someone else as the owner of the meeting. And I'm gonna go ahead and close this company-wide meeting. Now let's say that you have multiple cameras and multiple microphones on your computer or computers. So I'm gonna double click this company-wide meeting again, and I'm gonna rejoin it as myself. No need for me to get um, alter in this one. So down at the bottom where it says, check your audio and video. This is one thing you can do. You're seeing your levels here, right? And I'm going to just close that panel and then I'm going to join now. And when I join now, I'm going to go to this ellipsis to the left of the leave call button. and I'm going to go to settings. And this is where I can see my default microphone versus any other microphones that I might have, right? And it's showing I'm on the default and you're seeing my voice register there, right? And then I can go to my speakers down here and these are the speakers that I can be using, my choices of speakers. And then on the left, I can go to video 
and I can choose which camera I want to use, right? And I can also adjust my video lighting. So once you join a meeting and you go to settings, if you're having problems with your audio and video, a lot of times it's because it's defaulting to the wrong audio or video source and you can change it through settings. I'm gonna go ahead and close that screen and I'm gonna leave this call. I'll end it for everyone. And I'm gonna return to the home screen for Meet. Now from the home screen from Meet, you can of course start a new meeting or it, join one by entering a code or a link. But in the upper right hand corner, you have settings as well. And so before you join a meeting, if you're joining it from me, you can make sure your defaults are right in terms of audio and video. Our final lesson is how to start a video meeting from Gmail. So I'm going to navigate using my apps menu to Gmail. And if you do this next thing once, you won't have to do it again. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna link Gmail to Meet. And to do that, I'm gonna use the settings gear in the upper right hand corner. And right under apps and Gmail, you'll see chat and meet. And then underneath it, a customized link, which we're going to click. At the bottom, I'm gonna just go ahead and check both of those boxes, chat and meet. And then I'm gonna choose done. And it lets you know that your Gmail needs to reload so those changes will be visible. So I'm gonna go ahead and reload. And like I said, that's a one and done. If you ever wanna undo it, you just go back to the gear and uncheck those two things and customize. And so on the left side of your screen now, you'll see four icons, mail, chat, spaces, and meet. We're gonna click on meet. And when you come in here, you can start a new meeting or you can join a meeting with a code. Before we do that, let me explain my meetings. It says any video meeting scheduled in Google Calendar will show up here until you access them. So we access that company-wide meeting, otherwise it would be showing in this list. Now it would show in this list for Alter as well if they customize their Gmail and if they have accepted or responded to the invitation. We're gonna go ahead and click on new meeting. And then it just says, share your new meeting, copy this link and send it to people you wanna meet with. Be sure you save it so you can use it later too. I'm gonna go ahead and copy the link. Now I could copy that link and send it to somebody in an email. I could send it to somebody in a chat. Down at the bottom, I can send an invite, right? The other option I have, so this could be like an off the cuff meeting, right? Need to meet with somebody like right now. So I'm gonna go ahead and click start now. And I have my camera shuttered, but it took me right into the meeting. So I'm dumped right into the meeting here. I'm gonna go ahead and leave the call and I can rejoin. I'm gonna return to the home screen and now I'm back on my Meet app. And you can also, right from the Google Meet home screen, you can click on new meeting. From here, you can create a meeting for later. You can start an instant meeting or you can schedule in Google Calendar. I'm gonna choose create a meeting for later and it basically just gives me the link which I can copy, send it to people and you wanna make sure that you send it to yourself so you have that link for yourself as well. So a few more choices than the linking meet to Gmail that you have when you start a new meeting from the Google Meet home screen. In this eighth and final module, we began using Google Meet. We started by scheduling a video meeting from Google Calendar, 
And then you learned how to join a video meeting from Google Calendar, as well as from an invitee's email. We went over the meet display screen and you learned how to present your screen in a meeting. We went on to managing meetings, looking at all the other options that we have available. You learned how to change your audio and video settings. And then we moved on to linking meet with Gmail and starting a video meeting from Gmail. And we ended by starting a video meeting from Google Meet. Thank you for viewing this Google Workspace video course. We started this course by using Google Drive. You learned how to sign into Google Apps and how to use the Google Apps menu. And then we went over the Google Drive display screen. You learned how to change your Google Drive display options, how to create a file from Drive, how to make a copy of a file, move a file to trash. And then we moved on to uploading a file from a hard drive, creating and managing folders, uploading a folder from a hard drive, and then you learned how to search for files, add shortcuts to my drive, and work with drive priority and workspaces for those of you with workspace accounts. We moved on to changing Google Drive settings, and then you learned how to sign into multiple Google accounts for ease of access. Our second module, we still continued in Google Drive, but we changed our focus to collaborating. So you learned how to share a file or folder and also how to share a link to a file or folder before we were able to publish a file to the web. Our third module got us started working with common features where we opened the docs application and you learn the things that are common between many Google apps. So you learned how to use the menu bar and the toolbar, how to rename your documents, the fact that everything that you create is saved in Drive. You learned how to use help, email a file, download files to, in other formats, and also how to open a Microsoft Office file in a Google app. And then we use that file to start working with versions. We switched our focus solely to Google Sheets. So we started by going over its display screen, and then we input some data and you learned a couple of shortcuts along the way. We created formulas, and then we moved on to working with functions. And then we worked with the Google Sheets functions list. You learned how to format numbers, preview and print a sheet. And then we moved on to creating a chart and working with the chart editor setup options as well as the chart editor customize options. We moved on to working with pivot tables and then creating and using named ranges and ended by learning how to protect sheets and ranges. In the fifth module, we focused on Google Docs, so we understood its display screen. We typed a few paragraphs. You learned how to change the view of a document, how to insert images and page numbers, also how to work with styles, which feed into the document outline, which we covered. And then you learned how to collaborate with suggesting mode and how to work with comments. In module six, we focused on using Google Slides. As usual, we got an overview of its display screen. We started by entering text on a slide and you learned how to create new slides and also how to duplicate slides and how to change slide layouts. You also learned how to change the view of a presentation. And then we added images to slides and you learned how to add, delete and reorder slides. We applied a theme to make our presentation more visually appealing. 
And then you learned how to add transitions and animations to your presentation before delivering a presentation. We ended by learning how to use presenter view and audience tools. In the seventh module, we use Google Forms. Of course, we learned the Forms display screen, which differs slightly from the other ones in that it doesn't have a toolbar or a menu bar. We created a form, we added sections and questions, and then we learned how to preview a form before we applied a theme to it. You learned how to view the form responses, both in Google Forms and by linking the form to a spreadsheet where you can view the responses. And we ended by using Google Meet. We started by scheduling a video meeting from the Google Calendar, and then you learned how to join a meeting from the calendar as well as from email. You learned about the Meet display screen, how to present your screen in a meeting, and how to manage your meetings by using more options. You learned how to change your audio and video settings, as well as how to start a video meeting from Gmail by linking Meet to Gmail. And then we ended by starting a video meeting from Google Meet. Thanks for watching. To earn certificates and watch our courses without ads, check out learnitanytime.com.